Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a special holiday edition of Your Encounter Today, where we're going to be talking about American history. You know, for too long, the church has been censored by the ACLU, silenced by judges in black robes, and seduced by a spirit of ecumenicalism. We have taken our seat on the sidelines, and we're allowing the godless liberal media and our universities and even lower education to teach our children and to tell us what American history is all about. Well, during this special holiday season at Encounter Today, we want to make sure you and your family know the truth behind America's history. And I want to hear from you. In fact, right now in the comments, tell me where you're watching from all over the world. And remember, like this video. Every like is a slap in the devil's face. And share this because during this holiday season, you, your family, your friends need to know the truth behind America's history. So I've compiled some highlights from some of my favorite interviews from historians and best-selling authors who are gonna tell you some things you didn't know about American history. This is gonna be a tremendous omnibus video full of information that's going to bless you and equip you to minister the gospel and to tell the truth about American history. You're gonna be blessed by this. Let's dive in. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to your encounter today. Never before in history has there been such a coordinated thrust to transform and to redefine this nation. And tonight we have a gentleman with us who is going to help us cut through the clutter of conflicting extremes and the conflicting historical narratives that are being presented to us today. But before I introduce him, we want to hear from you. Comment down there below this video and let us know where you're watching from. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. And this moment in history, we need you engaging with us with this content and making sure this message gets out to the whole wide world. Well, he's the president of Wall Builders, a pro-family organization that presents America's forgotten history with access to one of the largest collections of founding documents. He's an expert in American history. He's consulted with state and federal legislators. You've probably seen him on the Ben Shapiro Show, the Glenn Beck Program, Louder with Clouder, the Believer's Voice of Victory, TBN. And tonight he's here with us on Encounter Today. Would you welcome Tim Barton in the comments? Mr. Barton, it's so good to have you with us tonight. Alan, good to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's our honor and privilege because now it seems there's been an acceleration of an agenda of certain organizations like the 1619 Project to rewrite history and paint the founding of America and the founders as advocates of slavery or as evil. But before we get into that and the origins of the 1619 Project, can you tell our audience why does getting American history right matter? Well, so I'm going to answer first from from a faith perspective, because I'm a Christian uh, and I believe in the word of God. I believe in the Bible and in Jesus said in John 14, 6, that he was the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through him. It, it's significant that Jesus said he was truth. And also in the Gospel of John, it tells us what truth does for people. In John 8, 32, Jesus said you, we would know the truth and the truth would set us free. Truth brings freedom, but you can't be set free from truth that you do not know. And we live in a culture today that isn't even sure that truth exists anymore. Mm. We, we think it's subjective or it's relative. Well, well this is what it means to me, right? It's, it's, a, it's a my truth, it's a personal truth, but there's not objective standard absolute truth. And the further we get away from that, the further we get away from the reality of the gospel message, that there is a God, that we are a fallen, sinful, broken people, and that we need a Savior, but God sent a Savior for us in, in the person of His Son, Jesus, who came, revealed Himself on earth. But you can go through the Gospels, you can go through the Bible and learn this story, but the reason that even defending a, America's story matters is because if truth doesn't exist, I can say from a Christian perspective, then we really can't explain the gospel. We, we can't reach the, the lost world with the truth of Jesus Christ. We have to defend truth. And so it's not just the truth of the Bible, it's truth in general as a whole. Mm, yeah. if, if the Apostle Paul, when he wrote in Philippians 4, he said, brethren, whatever is true, think on these things. Well, we want to meditate on what is true. And in culture today, if you turn on the news, so often what you hear is people promoting an agenda or their version of the story, not always what was accurate with the situation that happened. We see that with some of the riots. We've seen that with some of the statues being torn down. We've seen so many issues in our culture today and so much of it goes 
back to the fact that we're not promoting truth, we're not defending truth. And so I can tell you as a Christian, as a believer, to me, one of the most important reasons why we need to learn the American story and then defend the lies or defend against the lies more specifically that are coming against the American story is because as Christians, we need to be lovers of truth and defenders of truth because truth is the whole foundation of the gospel. So what is the truth then? We see this kind of battle right now in, in America on what will define America's history. Will it be Jamestown? Will it be Plymouth? And with the rise of certain organizations like the 1619 Project, they're, they're leaning toward the Jamestown um, sins as the definition of what America is sure. and how it was founded. Could you break that down for us? Maybe even tell us, because your organization has worked with curriculums and schools, helped to develop curriculums and textbooks. What's happening right now with the 1619 Project? And then from there, talk to us a little bit about America's origins. Absolutely. So th for, for those that might not be aware, uh, the 1619 Project was a, a New York Times special that came out. And they were going back to 1619, which in 1619, there was a shipload of slaves that arrived in Jamestown. And the New York Times uh, production, the 1619 Project, they called it, when it came out, they said this was the birth of America. When slaves arrived in Jamestown, this is when America started. And America was built on the back of slaves. And everything that you think you enjoy today, you enjoy because of slavery mm -hmm. therefore everything that you think is good about america actually you should despise because the only reason we have it is because of slavery so capitalism a, a, a strong economy when we have and are recovering now a strong economy the, the only reason we have that is because of slavery they actually even went through and they identified candy bars the only reason we have candy is because of slavery and sugar cane and, and and that was the reason we had candy so you shouldn't even like candy because that came because of slavery and so they just go through and argue that everything in America was built on the back of slaves and because of slavery. Now, first of all, there's a lot of, of false, inaccurate lies that they are depicting in what they tell in general. Uh, when, when they were doing this project, they worked with several professors and, and these professors were, were not your Christian conservative right-leaning professors. They were by, by their own profession, liberal leftist professors and even they said when they saw the history that was being promoted in this 1619 project, they said, this really isn't accurate history. This really isn't what happened. And, and they were turned down when they were giving advice of how to present the correct story. And I would even probably disagree with some of their version of the correct story. Nonetheless, the 1619 project didn't even listen to the leftist professors. Mm. So they've had to make several corrections, several alterations already uh, because of some blatant inaccuracies. Why it becomes significant for us even to know or address this issue is because there's a lot of states throughout the United States that have already adopted the 1619 as part of their standards for their history curriculum in public schools in many of the states, probably some of you that are watching right now, in your state, the 1619 project is, is now part of the foundation for history curriculum in those public schools. So, wow. so this is a big deal for us to know and be aware of it. And, and, and Pastor, I, I can keep talking a long time about this. One of the things I think is important to note though, is even the notion that, that slavery began in America in 1619 is a very faulty notion historically. What we know is before Columbus even landed in America, uh, archeologists, archaeolo uh, people that get into anthropology, people that have studied a lot of the history, they largely have acknowledged and agree that the, the Native American populations, so the Native Indians who were in America before Columbus were already practicing slavery against other Indian tribes and it was one of the largest scale slaveries percentage wise in all of human history. They mm. estimate between 20 to 40% of all of the native tribes in, in North, Central and South America at that time were enslaved by other native tribes, which goes wow. back to like ancient Greek or Greece or ancient Rome, as far as just a sheer volume, the percentage number of slavery that was already existent here. With that being said, when the shipload of slaves arrived in 1619, there's a lot of context that's worth noting about this. The, the slaves that arrived, they were on a Portuguese slave ship and the Portuguese had slaves and they were transporting them. This Portuguese ship was captured by a British ship. And when this Portuguese ship was captured, there were, it's estimated 19 slaves that were on this ship. And the British ship was uh, along the coast of North America. And so they brought this ship of slaves to Jamestown and they delivered these 19 slaves to Jamestown. What is very historically significant 
is Jamestown did not have legalized chattel slavery at that time. What they had was indentured servitude. So when those 19 slaves arrived in Jamestown, they actually became indentured servants. And indentured Mm -hmm. servitude meant that you would work for as a servant for a family, for a household, for a set amount of time. Usually it was about seven years. And at the end of seven years, you were given your freedom and you became a landowner. So you're a free landowner. Those 19 slaves became indentured servants in America. And then not only were they given their freedom, they became landowners. What's interesting, it's it's believed that one of those individuals was a guy named Anthony Johnson, who initially had been a black slave, came to America, was an indentured servant, got his freedom, became a landowner. And then he began to endure indenture service to come and work for him because, again, at the time, Jamestown didn't have the chattel slavery that we so often think about with American slavery. So uh, the guy who, who had been an indenture servant, uh, Anthony Johnson, who is now indenturing servants, he says that I, I want to bring people in to work for me. And one of the guys he brought in worked for him for roughly that set amount of time, seven years, what it was. And, and then this servant went and indentured himself to another master. But Anthony Johnson starts looking around and going, wait a second. The guy that just worked for me for seven years was so ineffective. He was so unproductive. Maybe he was lazy. We, we don't really know. But Anthony Johnson went to court and said, I paid X amount of dollars for this guy to come work for me. The labor he gave me is not paid for the money that I spent for him. So I should get more than the seven years that he owes me. I should have this guy the rest of his life because that's how long it would take based on his labor to pay off the debt I gave. And the court ruled in the favor of Anthony Johnson, who was a black man who had been a slave, became an indentured servant, got his freedom, indentured other people. And now he went to court to try to get a lifelong slave. Well, the court granted it to him. It's believed that this was the first legal chattel slavery in America in Jamestown. And it was a black man owning another black man. So even the story of Jamestown is very, very different than what we hear today. And that's not to excuse the sense of Jamestown, because Jamestown really, even though they were founded as an Anglican colony, they really weren't people that followed the Bible very well. And so they did a lot of things that you can look at and go, okay, that was very fleshly. That was sinful. Sometimes it was wicked or evil. They were by no means one of the better colonies when you compare it to like a Plymouth or the Puritans that are coming over later, certainly it's, it's a different feel. Nonetheless, even this notion that the 1619 Project espouses that in 1619 is when chattel slavery first began in America, even that's not totally accurate. Now, when you're looking at that and we see the comparison between Plymouth and, and Jamestown, what happened when the first slave ship arrived, for example, in the area of Plymouth? Yeah, so and, and that's a really good point, Pastor, and I, I presume you're asking that because you know, but it's worth sharing. <laughs> In, in 1641, Plymouth passed uh, a series of laws, and, and some people actually argue that the Pilgrims were actually pro-slavery because in these laws they passed in 1641, one of the things that's in those laws is it does say that slavery was legal under two conditions. The two conditions were if you were accused of a crime, you could be put into slave labor to pay the penalty for the crime you did. So for a punishment for a crime, you could be a slave, or if you were captured in justified warfare, that was another legal means of slavery. But mm. it had to be justified war, which just put parameters around. You couldn't go and kidnap people, which is largely what was happening with the Atlantic slave trade with the slaves out of Africa, where tribes were kidnapping from other tribes and they were selling them to the Dutch, to the Portuguese, to the Muslim slave traders. So, so it really was kind of targeted saying that that kind of slavery is not tolerated. The reason we know that they were targeting that kind of slavery is because in 1646, the first shipload of slaves arrived in Plymouth. And by the way, in 1641, they also passed a law that said man stealing was illegal and could be a capital crime, meaning you could be put to death. Man stealing In 1641, more than 100 years before the Declaration of Independence and the founding of the nation. Oh, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, so way before the founding fathers, 1641, they passed a law that says man stealing is illegal. And they defined man stealing as if you kidnap somebody and you take them or even capture somebody, but it wasn't justified war, so it's kind of like kidnapping. If you capture somebody and you take them off of their continent onto a new continent and make them a slave on the new continent, that is illegal and could be a capital punishment. So you could be executed for that. So that's a law they passed 1641. 1646, there was a shipload of slaves that came and landed in Plymouth. And when it landed there, the people of Plymouth found out what was going on, and they found out that these were Africans 
who had been brought from Africa to Plymouth. And so the people of Plymouth went and they, they charged, they raided the ship, and they enslaved, or actually imprisoned, they didn't enslave, they imprisoned all of the crew and they charged them with the crime of man stealing. And then they freed all of the enslaved people who were Africans and set them free so they can go back to their home. So the very first shipload of slaves that arrived to the pilgrims, they freed and they imprisoned the people who were guilty of the crime of man stealing. So it is a very different feel from Jamestown. And, and both Jamestown and Plymouth were founded as Christian colonies. The distinction would be up in Plymouth, these were people who were really coming from the Reformation and they really wanted to study and learn and know the Bible for themselves. So one of the great distinctions you see between Jamestown and Plymouth is even though Jamestown professed to be Christian because they said, we're Anglican, we're gonna follow the Bible, they really were following the leadership of, of the Anglicans and Anglicans was the official church of England and slavery is legal and even promoted in England at that time. So Jamestown says, yeah, this is totally good. Well, the people of Plymouth who are studying the Bible and reading it for themselves and, and the reformers were the ones breaking off from the state established church that was under the king. So they're already leaning in the direction of pretty much if the king does it, we don't like it very much. And that was their feel of slavery too. They read the Bible and they thought this this is not treating our neighbors we would want to be treated. This is not doing what God would want us to do. And, and kind of the laws of nature would seem to indicate that God wants everything born into freedom. So they had a very different perspective. Both of them profess Christianity, but up in Plymouth, they certainly strove to be much more biblical in the application of their life and their laws. We seem today to have a very narrow view of history. We take kind of the worst moments in American history and we let it define the centuries of history that we have in this nation. For example, we, we use the chattel slavery and, and the antebellum South as kind of the definition of American history. Was that true? Was, was every state um, allowing slavery all throughout American history or were there states that never allowed slavery? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you look back to the original 13 colonies, there were, in every single colony, there was slavery at some point. When you go to 1776, when the founding fathers are doing the declaration, we're working on separating from Great Britain, Thomas Jefferson was one of the guys tasked, he was on the Committee of Five to draft the declaration. He was there uh, with John Adams and Benjamin Franklin, two very noted founding fathers, and then there was Livingston and Sherman who were with him as well. So those five guys were assigned the task of coming up with a declaration of explanation of why we're going to separate from Great Britain. Thomas Jefferson was in put in charge of being the official drafter, so he's going to write and come up with the wording and the language for this. If you go back and read Jefferson's original draft, the one that he came up with in the Committee of Five, the one that he goes and presents before Congress, go back and read his original draft. And what you will discover is that the longest grievance he had in the Declaration was a grievance against slavery. And if you remember the declaration, the way we see it today, there's 27 grievances. And those were 27 things that we identified that the king had violated the rights of the individuals. Uh, the king had violated what the founding fathers believed to be inalienable rights, whether the, it was legislative abuses or executive abuses or military abuses or judicial abuses. They go through in these 27 grievances and list all these different issues there, there were. But Jefferson initially had additional grievances and different ones from the 27 that were finally finalized. Jefferson's longest grievance was slavery. And you can go back and read Jefferson's writings about this. What Jefferson, and, and, and first of all, from the grievance, and the grievance Jefferson says that several of the states had passed anti-slavery laws and the king had vetoed every one of those laws. There were four states or four colonies before we separated from Great Britain that had all passed laws that were attacking slavery. And the king shook all those down. He says, you can't end slavery. You're British colonies and slavery is part of the British practice. One of the places that did this was Pennsylvania. And Benjamin Franklin was, was part of the anti-slavery movement in Pennsylvania. And when the king vetoed Pennsylvania's anti-slavery law, Franklin says, this is just one more reason why we should separate from Great Britain, separate from the king, because he will not allow us to end slavery in our state or in their colony. So there were several states already working to end slavery in their states. So Jefferson puts that in the grievance. And if you go read the grievance, it really is very well worded. A lot of great thoughts that Jefferson combines in there. But the point is when it goes and he presents it before all the Congress, John Hancock was the president of Congress at this time. And John Hancock had made the acknowledgement to the whole group. He says, we, we are only gonna put in the declaration what everybody agrees on, which is why 
one of the opening statements from, or actually opening kind of top title line from the declaration, it says the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. Hancock explains, we can only put in here what everybody agrees on because if the king is able to divide us along colony or uh, kind of geographic political interests, then if, if we are separated, we will surely be defeated and overcome. So we can only put in what everybody agrees on. Jefferson says that when they presented the declaration, this is where you can go read this in Jefferson's writings. Jefferson says, much to his regret, there were two states that did not support the anti-slavery grievance in the declaration. Those two states were Georgia and South Carolina. And Jefferson explained that those two states explained that up to this point, they hadn't tried to pass anti-slavery laws. They, they hadn't tried to end slavery in their state. And so that wasn't a grievance that they had against the king and they didn't think it needed to be in there. And since John Hancock said it had to be unanimous, they said, okay, then we'll remove this grievance. And Jefferson said that was very disappointing for him that they were not able to end slavery then. The reason this matters in context is because it does help you understand that there were many places already fighting against slavery. If, if you look at the Northern colonies, by the early 1800s, I think it was by 1804, slavery has been abolished essentially in all of the Northern colony states. It's only in the Southern states that slavery was kind of hanging on. And the Northern colonies were passing anti-slavery laws and abolishing slavery before anywhere else in the world. Hmm. Now, this didn't happen in the Southern states, but what's interesting is in March 2nd, 1807, Thomas Jefferson signs the very first law in the world to abolish the slave trade. We were the first nation in the history of the world to abolish the slave trade. England did it on March 25th, 1807. And, and people today might argue, well, England really did it first because their law went into effect first. The American law didn't go into effect until January 1st, 1808. So even though Jefferson signed into March, it's not until January the next year it goes into effect. What's worth noting though, is when England signed their law, they did a gradual ending of the slave trade because kind of what they explained is, if there are ships that already have contracts and they're already en route and they're already delivering or picking up or dropping off slaves, they can finish their contracts. And so for the Americans, January 1st, 1808, we're done totally. Nobody else can take, we're not transporting slaves. Slave trade has ended at that point in America. Well, England still had ships that were delivering slaves and that was still going. So technically America signed the law first and we ended the slave trade before anybody else in the world. In 1865, when slavery finally becomes illegal in America under the 13th Amendment, and, and before that from the Emancipation Proclamation, we're already making that step for Southern states in rebellion. Then you have the 13th Amendment, so it's illegal everywhere. We were the fourth nation in the history of the world to end slavery. At that time, there was 124 nations, and only four nations had abolished slavery at that point, which means 120 nations in the world still had slavery at that point. Today, there's 195 nations that are part of the United Nations, and 94 of those nations, they have still not passed laws abolishing slavery or criminalizing slavery, and 94 nations even wow. today, it's estimated that there's more than 40 million people today that are in slavery. So one of the things that we lose a lot of context in, in not knowing the whole story of even kind of slavery in America is America, before anybody else started fighting against slavery, right, legally, first with the states, and then with the, the 1807 uh, anti-slavery or anti-slave trade law of Jefferson signs, and then when we end slavery in 1865, we were the fourth nation in the world, so we were the first nation in the slave trade, fourth nation in slavery in general, and even today, America is one of the top nations in the world fighting against slavery, fighting mm. against human trafficking and sex slavery. America's doing more than basically anybody else in the world to fight slavery today. So where we lose context is people say, yeah, look, America did something really bad back there. That is absolutely true. America in our history, we've done very sinful, wicked, evil, fleshly things in our history. And it's worth noting that every nation in the history of the world has also done sinful, wicked, evil things because every nation has had people. And, and, and people, right, apart from in God, right. people apart from God do sinful, wicked, evil things. So every nation in the history of the world has done evil. And that's not to downplay that America, I'm not saying America hasn't done bad things and we should ignore bad things America's done. No, no, no. America's done bad things and it's certainly okay to acknowledge because we wanna be truthful, we wanna be honest. America had some, some bad, evil, dark, sinful moments, that's true. But we also ought to be honest enough to say that even though America did some really bad things, we ought to give America credit 
for being a world leader in ending slavery and opposing slavery and, and trying to free people even today we're doing more than basically anywhere else in the world and this is where we're just not getting a very honest picture because even if we talk about slavery in America, most people have no idea that slavery still exists in the world today, or that even over in Africa, there's more than 9 million people in slavery in Africa today, mm. enslaved by other Africans. This is still an evil happening today. Yes. Most Americans just aren't aware. And, and so one of the things the 1619 Project does, and, and it's one of the things that a lot of people are even arguing today, the argument is that America was the originator of slavery mm -hmm. and that America was one of the chief propagators of slavery and that America is still one of the great evil nations in the world today. You can only have that opinion if you know nothing about history <laughs> and nothing about the rest of the world. Unfortunately, that's just where a lot of Americans are today. We really don't know history and we really don't know context because we don't know what the rest of the world is like. Wow, that's very certainly very different from what you learn in American history one-on-one -on -one at the local Ivy League school. Do you think, now these are purportedly smart people, do you think they've just been taught wrong or is there intentionality and purpose behind what they're doing? That's a great question. And, and, and it's worth noticing that there are there, there really are two different kinds of people you deal with throughout life. You will deal with the intentional and the ignorant. And you said that in a really, really good way. The ignorant can be very passionate in their ignorance. Hmm. It's just that they have bad information. And so their passion is taking them in a false direction because they have bad information, right? They just don't know the truth. And, and this is where certainly as Christians, we want to be people that promote what is true and, and we want to pursue what is true. So one of the things that we would encourage is, is we should ask questions to gain context to gain understanding, to make sure that what we're believing is accurate, kind of like the Bereans did, where you read about them in Acts with Paul, where it says that when Paul would, would teach to them, the Bereans would search the scriptures daily to make sure Paul wasn't lying to them. And, hmm. and I always imagine this, right? Like Paul was up talking to them and he says, well, we know the prophet Isaiah prophesied about Jesus. And they're like, wait a second, somebody go get a scroll of Isaiah. We wanna <laughs> see if this guy's being honest. And they open up the scroll and they're like, oh, yeah, it does say that. Okay, Paul, continue. And Paul says, and the prophet Joel said this, and like, somebody go get the scroll of Joel, right? Like, they're going to make sure that what he's saying is true. So often today, Americans, we, we don't pursue truth. We just take for granted that if somebody has a PhD or if somebody is, is on the news, they must know what they're talking about. If somebody has a blog, if somebody wrote an article for some newspaper, for some magazine, for some online publication, they must know what they're talking about, so I'm going to take their word for it. Th that's really not a good position or a good posture for us to take because you have a lot of people who are just repeating bad information or false information, and this is where ignorance comes in, is we don't always know what we think we know. What we think we know isn't always true, and so we might just have bad information. On the flip side, there are some people who don't care what the truth is, and we see this a lot in our culture today where if you can turn on the news, for example, and you'll see people being dishonest and they know what the truth is and they're still being dishonest because they care more about their side winning than they do about actually promoting mm. what is true. And the culture we are in today, we are so divided that people care more about their side being the winner than they care about what is actually true. And this is where we talk about intentionality. And we have to be very careful that we are not following people who are, are being intentional and being dishonest because they care more. It's kind of Machiavellian that the end would justify the means. Yeah. They care more about their side winning. Therefore, uh, I'm going to distort what actually happened just so you're going to lean more to my side or my position. This happens a lot with American history. And we certainly see this with even a lot of things promoting from the 1619 Project, a lot of their arguments, a lot of their solutions. Uh, the, the people who are behind the 1619 Project, um, they promote socialism and communism and Marxism, things that are incredibly destructive, that, that have not worked well for nations or societies in the history of the world. But if you don't like the Constitution, if you don't like capitalism, if you don't like the Founding Fathers, if you want to fundamentally transform America, then part of what you do is you have to attack the existing structure and so you have to make it seem as evil as possible and this is where to mm -hmm. them the end justifies the means because it's okay if we're being dishonest to to exaggerate to help you see that you should come to our side because what matters the most is that we get people on our side because we want our side to win 
And this is where, again, I'm gonna tell you as a person of faith, as a Christian, as a Christian, I wanna always think differently because I wanna make sure what I believe is true. And this is where even the way we, we learn from the Bible, when, when you read through the Old and New Testament and we learn the stories of the Bible, the Bible is really good about telling us the whole story. Yes, when, yes. when, for example, we read about King David in the Bible. We know that David was an amazing warrior. When David goes before King Saul and he wants to go fight Goliath, and Saul says, I'm not sure we should send this kid out to fight a giant who's a warrior. And David says, no, no, it's fine. I've already killed lions. I've killed bears. This dude's no problem for me. And it's believed that David was between maybe 14 to 17 years old when he killed Goliath. So if he's saying he's already killed lions and bears before he was 14, so he's 10, 11, 12, 13, killing lions and bears, that's crazy. I'm from Texas. And, and I've been a hunter most of my life and I have some big guns, but you still give me a big gun and you drop me off in the woods and there's lions or bears around. I'm kind of terrified <laughs> with a big gun. David had a stick and he had rocks and he was killing lions and bears. This dude was an amazing warrior and we know he kills Goliath. Not only that, the Bible tells us that David was an amazing worshiper. We know he had an anointing for worship. When King Saul was troubled by evil spirits, David would come in and David would play his harp. And when David would play, Saul would feel better. And David wrote the majority of the book of Psalms. David was really gifted as a musician, as a worshiper. But the Bible continues the story of David. The Bible talks about David as a family man and as a father and actually shows how David was a pretty terrible father and a terrible family man. It tells us about the story of Amnon and Absalom and Adonijah. And just to remind, Amnon was the guy who had a crush on his sister. He raped his sister and Absalom, who's a brother, found out and Absalom goes, heck no, Absalom goes and kills Amnon. Absalom then decides he wants a throne from his father. He tries to violently overthrow his father. Absalom is killed. Adonijah then decides he wants a throne from his father. And when the Bible introduces Adonijah to us, it says Adonijah, comma, the son whom David never once corrected, comma, and then mm. it tells the story of Adonijah. But you have to stop and think, the Bible just made a point of saying David never once corrected Adonijah, which means David never once was like, hey, hey, buddy, hey, we, we don't need to do that. That's, that's not a good thing. You never once told your son that he should or shouldn't do. You never offered correction to him or instruction to him. That's a terrible father. Well, David was not a very good father. And the Bible shows us that about David. The Bible also tells us about Bathsheba and Uriah, Bathsheba, who he had the affair with, and then Uriah, who he had killed. David was an adulterer and a murderer. He was a terrible father. David wasn't really a good guy in a lot of respects. So what's interesting is not only does the Bible tell us the whole story, the Bible shows us a lot of dark moments or sinful moments in David's life. Well, in modern culture, what we are saying today is we can't celebrate people who have messed up. We can't celebrate a nation that has made mistakes. And that's a really foolish position because then you could never celebrate anybody except you could still celebrate Jesus because he was perfect and that would be a great thing. Let's celebrate Jesus, except that's not the direction they go. They want to just downplay America. But the question is significant. How could we ever celebrate King David yeah. knowing that King David did so many bad things? And here is the important part I think we so often forget. The reason we can celebrate King David is because we're not celebrating his sin. What we are celebrating is how a perfect God mm. used an imperfect man yes. and did great things through him. This is the story of America. We don't celebrate the dark, wicked, sinful, evil moments in our nation's history or in some of our leaders history or their story. What we celebrate are the moments when we see how God used them and did something special through them and so even though this nation is not perfect and, and nobody that's ever been in this nation has been perfect, we still can look and see how those imperfect people still did some very great and honorable things, even though they weren't perfect. But this again is part of the context and the story of American history that we just don't get today. And it's because there are people very intentional saying that, well, America's evil and needs to be destroyed, needs to be torn down because we did bad things in our nation's history. Well, every nation in the history of the world at some point has done bad, wicked, evil, sinful things. That's because there's been people in that nation and people 
sinful, wicked, evil people do sinful, wicked, evil things. And by the way, even Christians, sometimes we're struggling to live godly lives at times. Yeah, we mess up. That's the reason Jesus came because nobody's perfect. So if we read history with an expectation that everybody needs to be perfect and never mess up, then we don't understand human nature or history or Bible at all. But once you understand Bible, and you understand that God uses imperfect people and God can do great things through broken, weak, imperfect vessels because that's the only option he has, then you can still see those moments where God did something special. And even for America, how even though we've done really bad, sinful, wicked, evil things at times, I I challenge people all the time. You point an atrocity in American history, something bad, wicked, sinful, evil that happened in American history, and I will point out to you the Christian leaders the pastors and the churches who rose up to put a stop to that sinful, wicked, evil thing, you pick anything you want. If you want to talk about slavery, guess who the majority of the abolitionists were? They were Christians. Yeah. They were pastors. Yeah. They were leaders from the church. Right? It, it was almost always, and this is, this is where America's been so different than the rest of the world. It's not that we haven't had problems, but it's that every time problems have risen up in our nation, God has risen up Christians and leaders to fight against, to help overcome those problems in American history. And that's where America has been really special. Well, you've hit the nail on the head and we're seeing in full view the the prophecy of George Washington being fulfilled of the spirit of party really uh, devolving in the United States to the point that a lot of ministers are hesitant to get involved and they kind of bought into the notion that it's inappropriate to get involved in politics. What was the role of ministers? You mentioned that just a moment in the in the founding of America. And what should pastors be doing today, especially leading into an election? That's a great question. I think a lot more pastors are are waking up a little bit more, as many of them have had to navigate this situation with uh, restrictions put on churches that are not put on other businesses and organizations. We've seen this a lot in California, and really there's been many states and many cities where those limitations have been put on churches. The reality is churches should be considered essential services. The churches are protected in the First Amendment. Liquor stores are not protected in the First Amendment. (laughs) Churches are. Churches have more protection, arguably, than any other organization. And the fact that churches are not considered essential is just ludicrous historically and constitutionally. Now, back up historically, one of the things that's very evident in early America is how much pastors shaped and influenced the foundation of America, even leading up to the revolution. We've had even more modern historians, historians from the 20th century, who identify that there's a lady named Alice Baldwin, who was a professor at Duke University many years ago. She wrote a book called uh, The New England Clergy in the American Revolution. And in this book, she identified that when you read the Declaration, there are 27 grievances. And every single grievance listed in the Declaration, every issue the Founding Fathers covered in the Declaration, had been preached from American pulpits prior to 1763. Wow. So more than a dozen years before we ever had the Declaration of Independence, pastors were saying, hey guys, this is happening in culture, but here's what the Word of God says, and here's what we should be doing based on what the Word of God says. They were very much into a practical application of Scripture for daily living. One of the things I think has been very lost in, in kind of modern church movement is a lot of what the Apostle Paul did. If you read the Pauline epistles, and and, and you can pick basically anyone you want to, but if you read the Pauline epistles, Paul was writing to a specific group of people, addressing specific issues they were doing with, and encouraging them how to live godly based on the issues they were dealing with, based on how they should interact, how, how they should handle these situations. Pastors, if we just followed what Paul did for the early church, pastors would be saying, okay guys, So we're seeing this happen in the business community. We're seeing this happen in schools and education. We're seeing this, here's what we should be doing based on what we are seeing and based on what the Word of God says. But so often pastors are told, wait a second, you shouldn't get involved in that because sometimes they have this false notion that there's a separation of church and state, which is not in the Constitution, right? That that's been a terrible read of history. Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to a group of Baptists in Danbury, Connecticut, and the Baptists had written him a letter asking for help, asking for his intervention, because at the time they lived in a state that was a congregational estate. The Baptists were the smallest denomination of that time, and they said, President Jefferson, we know that you are a fan of religious liberty and, and that you are not in favor of having an established denomination in a state or a nation. Could you do something 
legally to make sure that as Baptists, our religious freedoms will never be never be threatened. And Jefferson writes him back and says, guys, you don't need to worry about having your freedoms taken away. That's the reason we have the First Amendment, which says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So Congress cannot establish a certain denomination that everybody in America had to follow, which is what did happen over in England, where the king said, everybody's gonna be Catholic. And then he said, no, everybody's gonna be Anglican. And if you didn't follow that, you could be put in prison, which you can go back and read the story of William Penn. This, this is his story. Part of the reason he came to America was looking for religious freedom, which was part of the reason that many early settlers came to America was they were persecuted for not being part of the state established denominational church in the nation they were from. So Jefferson tells them that Congress has already passed a law saying that they can't establish a religion and that they cannot prohibit your free exercise of your religion. He says, we have thereby erected a wall of separation between church and state. Your rights are forever going to be protected from the federal government. Jefferson didn't say that the government had to be secular. What he said was the government could never interfere with your religious practices as a church, and they could never make the entire nation forced to be part of a specific Christian denomination. That, that's his letter. Now, today that's been turned on its head where people say, well, separation of church and state means you can't have anything Christian in education or business or government or medicine. Well, that's not historically accurate at all. That's not what the letter says, and it's not in the Constitution. It's not what the founding fathers intended. That's just what a judge said one time, and now people are just following whatever that judge said, which is, again, totally historically inaccurate, constitutionally inaccurate. Nonetheless, some pastors think that because they're not supposed to talk about politics or government or education, that, that really they should just focus on telling people about Jesus, and that's all they should do. Well, certainly, as a Christian, I want everybody to learn and know about Jesus However, one of the things Jesus said is, if you love me, keep my commands. Mm. If you just go through the Gospels, th there's hundreds of things that Jesus was telling people to do and not do. And if we believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, then arguably every command in Scripture are things we are supposed to follow. Now, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. So not that we are saved by our obedience to his commands, but we show our love for him by we do what he says, right? He told the disciples, if you love me, do what I say. W well, then as Christians, we wanna make sure we do what he says. So often in churches, we spend so much time telling people about who Jesus is and not teaching them how to live according to what Jesus said hmm. is the way we ought to live. And, and this is really kind of the notion of discipleship. And, and there's not, unfortunately, there's not the majority of churches in America that, that are, are teaching and making disciples of all nations like Jesus taught. Because if, if we were making disciples, then we wouldn't be confused on the issue of, of life. If That's we talked about abortion, and, and right, we know that God is the author and giver of life. We know Psalm 139, that God is the one who forms and knits us together in our mother's womb. Jeremiah 1, 5, where God told Jeremiah, before I even formed you, I knew you. We know that God makes everything on purpose and for a reason. And so if he's creating this human life, he's formed this life, it's on purpose and for a reason. There's value to that life. Even interesting, if you read in the Gospel of Luke, when Elizabeth, chapter one, verse 41, goes to visit her cousin Mary, and it says, the baby inside her womb leaped for joy, the word for baby in Luke 1, 41 in Greek is brephos. Well, if you go to Luke 18, when it says that the disciples were bringing babies unto Jesus that they could be prayed for, and that he would bless them, that those were born babies, it uses the word brephos. It's the exact same word in the mm. Bible for an unborn child and a born child. What it means is in God's economy, those are both life of child. Whether it's in the womb or out of the womb, God's in God's economy, God's kingdom, it is the same. Well, here's why I bring this up. Because the issue of the value of life shouldn't be confusing for Christians at all. And yet there's a lot of Christians who think, well, it's a woman's body, it's her choice, or if it's before 20 weeks and, and the baby hasn't really been formed yet, there's a lot of really bad arguments that people have in favor of abortion. But see, if, if we were just teaching the whole of what scripture taught, this wouldn't be a confusing issue. Or the idea of what a family looks like. Hmm. When in the 10 commandments it says, honor your father and your mother, right? When Jesus said it in, in, in Matthew 19, for this reason, a man will be or a man will leave his father and his mother. He'll be joined to his wife. The two become one flesh. But he says a man. And then he says a wife. 
and, and they'll be joined together. He says, but God has put together that nobody come against. In the beginning, it was Adam and Eve, and, and he put them together so that they could be fruitful and multiply. The family unit was the mom and dad, the husband and wife, and they had kids. And, and, and there's a lot of Christians today that, that think human sexuality is okay in lots of different ways apart from how God intended. And there's a lot of pastors who are scared to touch on this issue. The Apostle Paul in many epistles talks about human sexuality. The Bible is very clear on what a family should look like and what that family structure should be, even on what gender is, right? In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that God made them in his image, male and female, he created them. There's just so many issues, even inside the church that pastors have not really taught their their congregations very well on. So a lot of Christians are confused on issues that biblically should not be confusing because the Bible is very clear. What we see historically is pastors in early America, they would look around and whatever was happening in culture, they would teach from their pulpit. I, I'm sitting in, in our Wall Builders Museum and Collection and actually uh, kind of we're in a display section, but in a room just over my shoulder, we have thousands of original sermons from the founding era. So sermons from some notable names. We have some sermons from George Whitfield from the first great awakening or from Charles Finney from the second great awakening, some notable pastors, but we have a lot of sermons from the founding era where we can show that these pastors were dealing with very specific issues when it came to public policy, when it came to education, when it came to government, when it came to family, things that we're still dealing with today. And this is where I would encourage for, for any Christians, for any pastors that are watching to recognize that the Bible was written, not just for us to learn how to live in relationship with God, but how to live in the life that God has given us here on earth, how to interact with other people, how to promote and uphold godliness in our daily lives and the jobs we have, how to be a good coworker, how to be a boss, how to be a good parent, how to be a teacher. The Bible gives direction for all of this and we ought to go to the Bible a lot more than just spiritual edification. We ought to go to it almost like the marching orders, the owner's manual. How do I make this thing work? How do I do what God wants me to do? And, and if we would go seeking to become disciples, we would have a much different application than what a lot of pastors are offering today. Well, this is so rich and it's so good. And I think what you're doing at Wall Builders is so vital. I want all of you watching that are part of the Encounter Today family, there's a link in the description here to go check out Wall Builders and see what's happening in that ministry. But I wanna, before I let you go, I've only got a few more minutes with you. I wanna do kind of a lightning round with you because there's been a lot of Christians who have been disenfranchised and even knowing what sure. the stakes are, they kind of feel like sure. I don't wanna go and vote for the lesser of two evils. Is, is, sure. it, is it biblical to vote for the lesser of two evils? Well, I will point out, unless Jesus is on the ballot, it will always be the lesser of two <laughs> evils. It's always gonna be. And let me remind you, the only time Jesus was ever on the ballot, they chose Barabbas. Wow. So, so even if we thought we need Jesus running, I'm not convinced that people would even choose Jesus if he was running just because of the hearts of men, right? So often it's not where it needs to be. So with that being said, there's always going to be the lesser of two, two evils. However, as Christians, one of the things that we should always get direction from the Bible, the Bible tells us that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, righteousness should be our pursuit. Proverbs 14, 34 says righteousness is what exalts a nation. So righteousness should be a priority for us. So we ought to be asking the question, then how do we promote righteousness? Yeah. And this is where we can go to the Bible. And, and I would argue that there are, are several things that would impact the righteousness of the land. For example, the fact that in America, we can look back since 1973 with Roe versus Wade, we've killed more than 63 million mm. unborn babies. That's evil. That is not righteous. So if we want to promote righteousness or restore righteousness in America, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we are voting pro-life, okay? Now that's one thing, I'll go even further. The Bible talks about that the family is what God put together and, and we know biblically, historically, the family is the strength of a community. The family unit is the strength of, of a county or a state or even a nation. The stronger the family is, the better that nation does. and the better the kids do. What we know, even just looking at statistics today, is kids that come from broken homes have a lot more challenges. And that doesn't mean, I, mean, I understand, a lot of people probably watching, there's been some brokenness because that's sometimes it's part of life and, and, and things happen and we deal with stuff. 
But what we know is that God's ultimate plan and design was for there to be a mom and a dad, and, and God wants that union to be together for life. And when two people submit to God and love and serve each other, that, that can happen and that can work well, and that's God's design and intent. But, but the family was God's design. And actually God even gave parameters around human sexuality. And, and I would even point out that this would be a priority to God because the family was something God even addressed in the 10 commandments. When, when God said that we should honor our father and mother, not only is God encouraging kids, the behavior they should have in a family unit, God's identifying the family unit's really important because there's a mother and father, even in the 10 commandments. He says, don't commit adultery. Well, what does adultery do? Adultery often will bring brokenness into a family. Adultery has been the cause of many divorces throughout the history of humanity, and especially we see that in America. God, when he says don't commit adultery, he's trying to protect the family unit. The family's important to God. So I would say not only could we look at the issue of life, we could look at the issue of family. I think religious liberty is a huge deal because the Bible says that we are supposed to be able to acknowledge God. Jesus said, if you'll acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your steps. The Bible says we're supposed to acknowledge God in all our ways. We are now seeing in many places where people are saying, oh, kids, you can't pray in school, right? We can't have faith in government or politics, or we can't have faith-run businesses. No, no, no. I'm supposed to acknowledge God in all my ways. That means everything I do. So if I run a business, I should be acknowledging God in my business. If I am in a family, I acknowledge God in my family in all my ways. If I'm an employee, I acknowledge God. Whatever I do, I acknowledge God. Well, you have to have religious liberty to acknowledge God. And the fourth thing I would say is Israel. And I'm not ranking these in order of importance. I think all four of these are very important, but Israel is something that as Christians, we should remember when God made a covenant with Abraham, God told Abraham, I will bless you and make you into a nation. Hmm. And I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. Historically, we can see that when America's done a good job being friends and allies to the nation of Israel, we've enjoyed God's blessings. When we have opposed Israel as a whole, we've put ourselves in a place where God says, I will curse those that curse you. I always want to be in the position where I am blessing Israel. And yeah. so those four things, we can talk about life, we can talk about family, we can talk about religious liberty, and then Israel, those are four things that I would say promote righteousness. Now, why does that matter? because it doesn't matter the personality of who is running. It matters the policies that they promote. God doesn't necessarily bless a nation based on the personality of the leader or based on the tweets of a leader. God will bless or curse a nation based on the positions or the policies that they take. Because I can tell you, if, if we have a leader, and, and right now it's Donald Trump, and, and I understand there's people all different sides of uh, positions with Donald Trump. I can tell you, I appreciate a lot of the policies that President Trump has put forward. I also have several personality things about President Trump that are, I'm, I'm not totally crazy about. There's been many tweets I've not been a fan of. So I, just very candid, I, I'm not totally in favor of everything he does. And if we were honest, I'm not totally in favor of everything I do either. I disagree with some of my behavior quite often. So. I'm gonna give other people a pass at times too. With that being said, the Bible prioritizes issues over personalities. Mm. Policies are the bigger priority than a personality. And this is where looking at elected officials, I am much more concerned with the policies that you are promoting because that will tend to put our nation in a place where God can bless us or where we're gonna be in a position where we might have to watch out for the judgment of God based on bad policies. So policies are much more important when it comes to righteousness than are the personality of the ruler. Now, I want to get into the most hot-button issue in the last two minutes I have with you. Is it constitutional? When we're dealing with the concept of a pandemic, that was nothing new to the Founding Fathers. They dealt with yellow fever. They dealt with smallpox. So they certainly believed that government had a role to play. But how far can the government go? And when we're dealing with church closures or we're dealing with yeah. the mask mandate, is it constitutional? So it is not constitutional from a federal level. However, the founding fathers, when they wrote the constitution, uh, they gave the federal government very specific role, job, authority, responsibility, and they said anything that's not in the constitution giving power to the federal government belongs to the states. And the reason they gave it to the states was because in your state, you have the ability to recall bad elected officials. 
you have the ability to vote them out and put somebody new in their place. So you have better accountability of those elected officials. Can elected officials impose bad policies? Absolutely they can. Now, I would argue it's not constitutional on any level, even for your state governor to close down churches. Right. The way the constitution reads today is he can't close down, he can't give a, a different standard of churches than he gives to Walmart or to Lowe's or Home Depot or to the alcohol stores. So if he has one standard for churches and one for other groups, that's that's unconstitutional because he's against religion at that point. Constitutionally, if he has the same standard for everybody, then that would be harder to win constitutionally. But if you're in your state and you're saying, this guy is violating our freedom, our beliefs, he's taking away our God-given right of worship, of religion, of our Christian faith, at that point, this is the reason that the, the founding fathers gave that control to the state authority, because you say, you know what? I'm gonna make sure this guy's never in that elected position again. I'm gonna vote for somebody else. We're gonna recruit a new candidate for office. I think a lot of people in cities just found out who their mayor is for the very first <laughs> time because of coronavirus. I think a lot of people had no idea who the mayor was because the mayor hadn't done things that they had seen the direct impact on themselves. Now that we're seeing the authority that some of these leaders have, it's going to encourage a lot of people to go, you know what, I better get involved and vote next time because I want to vote for someone who will protect my God-given freedoms, my God-given rights, my constitutional rights, so that I don't have my rights violated by the government. And this is part of where we the people are in charge. Yeah. And this is the accountability the founding fathers intended for we the people to have. This is why we love wall builders, because if we're gonna really have a revival in this nation, it's going to first have to look like a reformation. And wall builders is on the front lines of that move, bringing it to the states, not just to churches, but helping to get this kind of curriculum and teaching into schools as well, and educating ministers and people all across the nation and around the world. And and we want to sow into you. We want to sow into wall builders. All of you watching right now who are part of the Encounter Today family, go to EncounterToday.com. And when you give today, we're going to take a portion of that gift and we're going to sow into wall builders and we're going to be a blessing to them and make sure we help them keep moving things forward. In fact, if you're new to the Encounter Today family and it's your first time giving, we're going to send you this teaching series called Armed Powerful Prayers for Perilous Times, absolutely free, six series session, six hours of teaching on the subject of prayer because because we want you to be equipped for these last days. Now, Brother Tim, when, we, when we're talking about what's coming in the future of wall builders, you and your father, David Barton, are coming out with a new book. What's that gonna be about and where can folks find it? Absolutely, so I, I appreciate you letting me plug this for a second. The, the new book is called The American Story. And I, it's one of the things that I think we're, we're the most excited about maybe of anything we've ever done. It is a history book, but it tells the stories of people, kind of like King David. The Bible tells us the story of King David, and you realize he wasn't perfect, but God used him in some really cool ways. He did some great things throughout his life. It, it starts with the story of Columbus, and it goes all the way through Abraham Lincoln, and we highlight dozens and dozens and dozens of people in the story. And what you see is how a perfect God used imperfect people and did great things through them, and you learn the context of the story. So today there's a lot of accusations against so many early heroes in American history, and, and, and sometimes what they're accused of is just blatantly false, that's a lie. They didn't do anything close to what they're being accused of. Sometimes things are being accused of, you can go, well, well yeah, they, they did that, but sometimes they repented of that and they changed and they never did that again. Or sometimes you can say, yeah, they did that and that was really bad, but that's not the only thing they did in their life. So even though we can say this was really bad, we also can acknowledge that this was a moment where God used them for something really cool, but you learn the whole story mm. and, and you're able then to make kind of judgments and assessments based on knowing that story. So it's a history book, but it's a biographical history book. Uh, it, it's heavily documented and footnoted. We have a lot of their quotes throughout it, but it's really a storybook. So it's a great way to learn more about America's history and the people that gave us America. And, and just like so many heroes from the Bible, you realize that these were not perfect people, but they were people so often who were seeking to be used by God. And you will see how God in many ways used them and did great things for this nation through them. Well, in times of mass deceit, I don't know if there's anything more important than books that bring truth to the people. And I can tell you this book's going to be mandatory reading in the DiDio household and Encounter Ministries. And we want everybody watching to go get a copy. The link is in the description. Mr. Barton, we can't thank you enough for being with us today. 
Pastor, thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed being with you. Well, I hope we can have you back again sometime. All of you watching on Encounter Today, make sure you comment. Let us know where you're watching from. Share this video, and we look forward to seeing you again next time right here on Your Encounter Today. Well, I hope you're enjoying this holiday history special on your encounter today. You know, without your support, we could not bring you videos like this and tremendous interviews like we're showcasing here in this holiday special. Here's what we need you to do right now. Go to EncounterToday.com and give an obedience to the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you give to the Remnants Prayer Arsenal a gift of any size, it doesn't matter the amount, we want to send you as our gift to you absolutely free two of our classic series, Teach My Hands to War and Armed Powerful Prayers for Perilous Times. These two CD series with more than 10 hours of instruction on the subject of prayer, I believe can create a massive prayer movement in this nation that can bring tremendous change and a great awakening. Let's all be speaking the same thing. Let's all be praying the same thing by joining together in these series and learning these principles because it's not enough to pray. You have to know how to pray right. So go to Encounter Today com and give under the designation of the Remnants Prayer Arsenal. Be sure to include your mailing address when you give so that we can mail you these two CD series that I know are going to be blessing to you. They make great stocking stuffers too for your loved ones, for your family who love the Word of God. Go to EncounterToday.com do it right now and help us continue to preach the gospel around the world. Now let's go to the next interview. Well, good evening everybody and welcome to your Encounter Today. I'm Pastor Alan DiDio and what is going on in America today. And what does history have to teach us about what's been taking place? But we want to hear from you tonight. I've got a very special guest, but I want to hear where you're watching from. Be sure to write down in the comments where you are. I want you to like, I want you to share, I want you to engage. Because tonight I have with me an award-winning author, a freelance columnist, a producer who has debated atheists, and he has vied for truth on CNN, the Al Jazeera Network. He's spoken at Oxford and Princeton universities. His name is Larry Talton, and he's becoming one of our favorite rogues. Larry, <laughs> it's good to have you with us today. Hi, it's, uh, it's great to be with you, Alan. Now, I have to tell you, I, after we first corresponded, I went back and looked, and I was familiar with your work because I didn't realize that you did a debate with Christopher Hitchens some years ago. That's right. I sure did. I sure and, did. I also wrote a book about him. I, and that book caused no small amount of, of controversy, <laughs> The Faith of Christopher Hitchens. That which controversy for something that never actually happened, but um, that's <laughs> another topic. And maybe we could do an interview sometime about that alone because it's a, what I've read so far is a, it's a phenomenal book. But I woke up, I think it was yesterday morning. That's how quickly things have transpired. And I somehow came across your latest article and I was riveted by its relevance as you kind of skillfully overlaid the events that took place in the latter end of the 19th century. And you contrasted two legends of history, two dynamic opposing personalities, Charles Haddon Spurgeon and Karl Marx, oddly enough, both of them lived in the same city at the same time. I don't know how I missed that point, but you brought it together. And I have to ask you, first of all, what gave birth to this? Where did this come from? Well, first of all, uh, Alan, you want to be careful saying that you woke up yesterday. You know, in, <laughs> in, our, in our current climate, you, you don't want to say woke. you're woke. You know, so right. you want to be very careful about that. Be very clear you're not in, in that camp. But, you know, in all seriousness, um, I, I've led many tours um, all over Europe. Um, I have two degrees in European history. Uh, I was in part educated um, in London, and I've given lectures at, at Marx's tomb and also at uh, Charles Spurgeon's tomb. And as somebody who taught um, the history of England for, for a very long time, I've always been fascinated by the middle and the latter half of the, the 19th century and so many of the major players who were um, uh, living and working in London at the same time. I mean, it's not just, just Marx and Spurgeon. It's Charles Darwin. It's Queen mm. Victoria. It's Disraeli. It's Gladstone. It's, uh, uh, it's David Livingston. It's... Um, uh, just a cast, of Charles Dickens, a cast of extraordinary characters who are alive at the very same time. But I've, I, I have um, been fascinated by the fact that these two 
um, were evangelists of sorts who were struggling for the souls of men, competing with very opposite um, ideologies and philosophies of salvation, so to speak, one of them purely secular and uh, a dead end and uh, that has led to the deaths of untold millions. And then Charles Spurgeon, who was pe preaching the blood of Jesus Christ. So that that just fascinates me that that was going on in the same city at the same time, and all the more so because very frequently we are talking about figures who might have been alive at the same time, but who weren't famous until well after they had passed away. In this case, both of them were famous at the, at concurrently, and that's that's interesting. Now, what is, by the way, when we're dealing with Marxism and, and socialism, I've been kind of amazed how the uh, Nazi symbols are, are decried as horrible and, of course, offensive, but the hammer and sickle are something that is somehow acceptable. And I'm beginning to think that now in, 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 in modern history, there are two kinds of people, those who understand Eastern European history and those who support BLM, uh, because it seems that our, the 20th century was defined by our, our struggle against these ideas, but no yes. one really knows anything about it. What is Marxism? What is socialism? Certainly it's compatible with Christianity, right? Because of its, of its uh, shtick of compassion and social justice. Yeah. Um, you know, I wrote a book about a decade ago called The Grace Effect. Mm. And uh, that book is really about socialism. Now, it's a story. Um, I'm smuggling in um, an argument against socialism without you knowing it. It's the story of the adoption of our daughter, Sasha, who was abandoned at birth and raised uh, in three different orphanages in the Ukraine, mm. um, where um, those orphanages were still running off of uh, the accumulated capital of the uh, of Soviet policies, which are just um, um, sole destroying. Um, we're, we're talking about um, ideologies that, uh, that really believed that they were scientific and that children could be raised um, according to quote-unquote science. They didn't need parents and uh, they're like plants. You just give them a little food and a little water and sunlight and, wow. and, and they're good. And of course they wrecked um, generations of children. You know, they were in power for some 75 years and we saw what what socialism um, is and, uh, and did, but so, uh, Karl Marx didn't invent socialism. Uh, Car Marxism is uh, his version of it. Socialism mm -hmm. had been pushed for, for quite some time, and it was this, this uh, unworkable idea of the redistribution of wealth. Uh, now, there are many who will look to, say, Acts chapter 5, and they will say, mm -hmm. well, well, isn't that socialism? Well, no, it isn't. You know, and, of course, I'm referring to the story of... Uh, um, of the church, um, the uh, the division of uh, where, where people were were sharing goods in common, right? And then Ananias and Sapphira, of course, I'm, I won't give a you know a, a, a exposition of of that passage, but simply to say, Ananias and Sapphira lie about what they've given, um, and they're confronted by Peter, and um, they're stricken dead. And I've I've heard people make arguments, Christians make arguments. Aha, see. They were stricken dead because they didn't give up their possessions. Mm. No, that's not at all what happened um, there. In fact, Peter makes a point of saying, "Were not was not your wealth yours? I mean, the field was yes. yours when you sold it. The proceeds, they were yours. You could do with them as you wanted. Uh, the Bible affirms private property, hence the reason we, we have such commandments as thou shalt not steal. So, um, they were virtue Lord, signaling. Pardon me? They were virtue signaling to everyone. You know, I love that. I love that, Alan. That's perfect. That's exactly what they were doing. And they were stricken dead for their lie, not for their failure to give. Yeah. Um, our God, who is all powerful, who could coerce any of us to give, does not. He commands it. Uh, he desires that we do it, but he doesn't confiscate it. And there's the difference. Um, we're we're mm. Christianity... Uh, a way of putting it might be this, a traditional view of government um, is that, uh, an American view of government, what I think is a Christian view of government, is, uh, is that government is an institution, that's a temporal institution meant to serve man who is an eternal being. Hmm. Socialists flip that on its head. Man, a temporal being, serves the eternal state. 
And, and that may not seem, that's a very significant difference. It's why, you know, when Lady Astor is sitting with Stalin, she asks him, when are you going to stop killing people? And he says, when it's no longer necessary. Now, mm. he was being quite sincere. Uh, you see, from a socialist point of view, uh, each of us, we're just, we're just the raw materials of building the state. We're just brick and mortar. None of us have any real individual value. And the reason is because socialism at its core is a spiritual question. It's not simply an economic or political question. And the reason is because socialism denies the very existence of the spiritual. You see, so we reduce man uh, to having no actual value. And this is, this is very, very important. It's why socialist regimes throughout history are able to annihilate uh, millions of their own citizens and see no real conflict um, with uh, the stated goals of the socialist regime. Again, people are just raw materials for the building of the socialist the ends justify the means. The ends justify the means, as Machiavelli would put it, yeah. uh, and the prince. And uh, socialism is the redistribution of wealth. It's the coerced redistribution of wealth. Um, and it is this idea that we all own and share everything in common. Now, um, this just, it's a failure to understand human nature. It's never worked anywhere um, on the planet. And uh, what's amazing to me is... Um, Advocates of socialism that you meet, uh, Alan, you know, we, we've, we've seen Mao killed no less than 70 million of his own mm. people in China. Um, the Soviets killed no less than 60 million of their own people. Now, that's before we get to socialist regimes in South America and Africa and other parts of Asia. So right there, we're, we're talking about, you know, roughly 130 million people, but the number's much higher. That's just in the 20th century alone. That's more than all previous religious wars from all previous centuries combined. Now, that's, that's very, very significant. But when you talk to socialists, they'll say, well, you know, they just got it wrong. It wasn't real just, socialism. It, it wasn't real socialism. Yeah. Well, when, it, when, when the death of George Floyd took place, I, I did a post titled, I blame pastors for the protests because in an ochlocracy, which America is increasingly becoming, every hashtag, every like, every share is a vote, and it contributes to the ever-growing snowball of outrage that then spills over into the streets. And I was questioning whether or not pastors in their rush to condemn racism and engage in the conversation that was really a flashpoint choreographed by the enemies of America, that they're actually contributing to the deconstruction of civilized society. Did Spurgeon at this time, was, was he aware of what was going on with, with Karl Marx and his ideas? And did he have anything to say to the pulpits of, of London? Well, um, First, let me say that I agree completely with what you've just said. This has nothing to do with George Floyd. Yeah. Um, there is uh, an article that, that your viewers, your listeners can find on my website, uh, Larry Alex Taunton. That's T A U N T O N, LarryAlexTaunton.com. It's an article titled Understanding What is Happening in America. A we'll link response. it in the description as well. Okay. That article has gone all over social media for, for quite some time. Uh, I guess I say quite some time, a few weeks. It's based on a lecture that I recently gave about Saul Alinsky. Mm. And Saul Alinsky was a Marxist thinker uh, in, the, uh, in the 20th century. Uh, Hillary Clinton knew him, was a disciple of Alinsky, as was Barack Obama. Um, he had a huge impact on them. And Alinsky wrote a book called Rules for Radicals. Dedicated and, to uh, Lucifer, the, if I remember correctly. Well, you know, it actually, so, so that neither of us gets in trouble over a, a silly um, point, he actually dedicated it to his wife. However, on the first page of the book, he says, you know what, we really should have a co-dedication here um, right. for Lucifer. So you're absolutely correct. I don't know what that uh, says about his wife. But but there's always, anyway. there's always somebody who will fire off an email you to you and say, well, you're not technically correct. But anyway, um, all of this is just by way of saying that Alinsky's rules, they're, they're following very carefully. And one of the things that Alinsky says is that the thing is never the thing. Hmm. In, in other words, if I'm the radical, I'm the Marxist socialist radical, and I'm attacking you, Alinsky's rules 
only work, and they assume that I'm attacking someone with a moral core. So what I do, and of course I don't have one, so I attack you. I make you ashamed of your heroes. I tell you that Washington and Lincoln were all slaveholders or racists or something else. I can find a flaw with no matter who your hero is, unless it's Jesus Christ, I can, can find a flaw with that. And uh, of course, I really don't care. Uh, what I'm seeking to have you do is to feel shame, um, feel ridiculed, feel embarrassment, and to, to busy you with formulating an argument to respond to me. But the reality hmm. is, I'm not interested in that. And, the and thing is not the thing. Yeah. The thing is not the thing. The thing is the revolution, says Alinsky. So George Floyd, this isn't about George Floyd. This isn't about, this isn't about um, a police brutality. Um, it's not about um, racial inequality. Marx was, a, Marx was a racist through and through. Yeah. He was a racist. I've just finished um, tweeting to the um, uh, head of, I believe it's the NAACP, who was talking about, Marxism and uh, how nobody's read it and everybody out there is criticizing it uh, Doesn't know the difference between Karl Marx and Groucho Marx and I just replied Well, clearly you haven't read Marx either because if you did you would know he's not your friend He was a hater of mankind and uh, and he hated black people and Jews most of all now to your question about Spurgeon um, Spurgeon to our knowledge. He never actually met Marx but I'm quite confident that he knew of Marx. How could he not have? Um, Marx published, Spurgeon burst upon the scene in London in 1853. Uh, Marx had published the Communist Manifesto in 1848, moved to London in 1849. So there you see, they share the same city for the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and then Marx dies in, uh, in 1883. And um, Marx became actually quite famous after the publication of the first volume of Das Kapital in 1867. And while he's never mentioned by name in any of Spurgeon's um, sermons, Spurgeon refers to the advocates of socialism, those people who have founded it, those people who are promoting it, uh, he says. And almost certainly that is an oblique reference um, to Marx. So I think he was very well aware of him, um, and I think he was certainly aware of what Marxism was, uh, what socialism was, and was, was out to denounce it as an anti-theology, as an anti-Christian worldview. Did he feel that pastors had any role in stemming the tide of these ideas? Um, yes, I think he did. Uh, in fact, in uh, the article that you're referencing of mine, um, Karl Marx versus Charles Spurgeon, that's the name of the piece, uh, um, he places blame, that is, Spurgeon places blame squarely on the shoulders of pastors hmm. in saying to them, um, the, the, the problem that so many people are being uh, seduced by these ideas is because so many Christian ministers have forsaken the gospel in their own pulpits. And so Spurgeon believed, as I do, as I think you probably do, and hopefully many of our listeners, one of the things that I said in a, in a, in a piece uh, maybe a week or two ago is a piece called um, A Letter to Pastors and uh, Churches. And I quote the Daily Wire, which many of your, your viewers or, or listeners are probably familiar with, Ben Shapiro's website. And... Um, where they had published an article with the title, Trump is Our Only Hope. And I found that to be a, um, a self-defeating um, mm. ar you know, argument. And I'm not, I'm not minimizing the role of the president of the United States when I say that our hope is not in the president of the United States, right. be it Donald Trump or, or Lincoln or Reagan or whoever you care to say. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. But I would also say that the pastors of, of America – play a much larger role than the president of the United States. Their collective role is huge in proclaiming the gospel. And I, I mentioned to you off air, uh, my son who you, you saw pop in and bring something to me off air for, for those of you who are watching. Uh, we were just listening to the Billy Graham channel. And um, I was telling him, I've just kind of discovered this on uh, Sirius XM radio. Hmm. And here is, here is Graham delivering a message in the early 60s, calling on America to repent of her sins and, uh, and calling on people to repent of their individual sins. And like Spurgeon, Spurgeon said, there could be na no national regeneration 
without individual regeneration. And so whatever policies, a Trump or anyone else, uh, no matter how Christian they are, uh, that's not going to bring about ultimate regeneration of this country. We need our pastors preaching the gospel, preaching sin, preaching hell, preaching grace, and preaching the cross. Yeah, people tend to really get in their partisan corners, and I'm, I'm, I'm with a lot of believers. I think they're there. We're tired of the partisan politics that tend to be embodied in personalities. Something bigger is taking place at this election. And, and you mentioned in your article that Marxism morphs. It originally started as this division of classes, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, and, and it goes along in history in disguise. It disguises itself. Mm-hmm. What does it look like today? Well, today it is, um, by the way, I have to say, uh, Alan, you're, you have a Spurgeon beard. So um, <laughs> I was you know, admiring yours as well that you've got. You, uh, you, have, you have a nice Spurgeon beard. Mine, mine is more like Chekhov. You know, yours is, <laughs> yours is a, a nice Spurgeon beard. So if you let it grow really wild, then it's Marxian. So <laughs> that's right. We can't have that. So, so keep it in its current. You I know, appreciate nice, that. Thank you for that nice, insight. Nicely groomed state. <laughs> um, I've even forgotten my question. Uh, your question. I'm sorry. Uh, we were talking about how uh, Marxism morphs and disguises uh, yes. itself. Marx, Marxism today uh, manifests itself as uh, racial inequality. Mm. And you see what they're doing, which is so deviously clever, is they're taking, they're packaging their sordid agenda inside of a much more appealing um, you know, they're cloaking it in packaging that has mass appeal. You know, so these pastors, as you were talking about those who are, you know, pounding their pulpit, let's say on racial inequality, um, you've already fallen for it when you're doing that. Yeah. Um, is there, is there racism? Well, of course there is. But our culture has been saturated with messages uh, that are about racial equality. They're against um, racism. And we have movies from Remember the Titans to 42 to, you know, um, uh, gosh, I, we could just sit here and list them all day long. Um, the, the culture has pounded that for, for a very long time. But when was the last time that people heard a message against Marxism? Right. Which has wrecked half the world and is threatening to wreck the other half. And I, I think what pastors are doing is they're unwittingly, I've had a number of people say to me, you know, my pastor is woke and here he <laughs> is um, uh, railing against um, racism. And I'm looking around at the congregation and saying, is there really anyone here who's in favor of racism? Is there anyone here uh, who is for racial inequality? And, uh, and I think that the answer to that is no, um, right. in, in most cases. And so, but I, what I do think is that in our congregations, there are many, many people who have been deceived, seduced by the message of socialism, of Marxism, and who think it's something that's quite good when it's actually quite satanic. And it was interesting from your article, you seem to indicate that it, that it got no traction in London, but it was received in open arms in Russia. Do you think that the, that the difference, the, the wall of separation that kept Marxism from really taking hold in London in the violent way it would have liked to was the preaching of folks like Charles Haddon Spurgeon? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, historian uh, Orlando Figes, uh, he's a Russian historian, but I, I read one of his books many years ago um, titled uh, A People's Tragedy. And in that book, Figes argues that when, uh, you know, that the, the censors in Russia almost let nothing through, mm. like, and almost nothing was allowed to be published um, because there was no free speech in Russia, and there's still no free speech in Russia. They don't have a, a tradition of that. But when um, uh, Marx's Das Kapital appeared on the desk of one of the censors, they wrongly assumed that because it was abstruse factory data, that almost nobody would read it. Well, the problem was, when they, so they allowed it to be published in Russian. And uh, it immediately achieved the status of holy writ, and that is because there were no, uh, to, to quote Phygis, he says, there were no viable competing ideologies in Russia at the time. Now compare that to, to London, where there was free speech. Uh, Marx had been published, um, he had been read, and he was being sharply criticized in the marketplace of ideas. See, this is what's changing 
uh, in our own country right now. We have such a strong tradition um, of freedom of speech, and that's 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 key to a democratic society because uh, I should be free to tweet, uh, you know, nonsense if I want to. You're free to tweet the gospel, or you're free to tweet Marxism, or you're free, you're free to tweet something else. But the point is, in a in a, a free society, um, those ideas are exposed to criticism that it can be silly, but it can also be very thoughtful critique. And see, the result was that Marx's ideas didn't gain ascendancy in the, uh, the 19th century um, of, uh, of, of Spurgeon because his ideas were critiqued and were deemed to be deeply flawed and foolish. Um, and a guy like Spurgeon and others like him are preaching against it. So do I think that they played a, an enormous role uh, serving as a bulwark, as it is, to prevent the, uh, uh, the horrors of Marxism being set loose on uh, 19th century Britain? I think the answer is yes. But in the continent, they suffered it for generations. I mentioned earlier that it seemed like the 20th century was defined by our struggle with Marxist, communist, socialist ideas. We almost destroyed Indeed. the planet over it. Do you feel like that that is going to, we're going to see a repeat of that in the 21st century? And if so, practically, what can Christians, pastors, believers do to make a difference? Well, um, I'll use this as an example. Following, in 1945, at the end of World War II, the U.S. State Department had one Russian speaker. One. Um, we weren't prepared for the Cold War. Um, that immediately began, you know, as, as Churchill so eloquently put it, an iron curtain fell mm. across Europe and the Cold War began and in the immediate aftermath of, um, of the Second World War. And America was caught ill-prepared. And, uh, and then the 50s come along and the Russians put up Sputnik and um, during uh, the Eisenhower administration. And there's this feeling that America is very behind in science. And the, American, uh, um, the Americans responded with, I was, I'm older than you, I suspect, but I was, um, I was taught Russian history in high school. I was taught Marxism in high school. Hmm. I was also taught the uh, the Declaration of Independence, and I was taught the uh, um, our Constitution, and I was I was actually taught also the Lord's Prayer, you know, in in public school. But the point is, I was made aware of who our enemies were and what they believed and what was flawed in those beliefs. And America began to ramp up its science curriculums and ramp up curriculums on what Marxism is and what they believe. And before long, the State Department is flooded with Russian experts, and we won the Cold War uh, as a result of that. I, I feel like that, that's, a, that's a, a nice picture of where I think we find our, ourselves. We have very few people right now in the pulpit who really know what Marxism is. We have very few, very few Christians who really understand the dangers of socialism because they mistake it for Christianity, which is nothing like Christianity. I, I love what Dostoevsky, the great Russian novelist, said. He said that, that socialism is, a, is an attempt to build heaven on earth. It's the Tower of Babel in, inverse. Mm. Um, that's what it is. It's an attempt to create heaven without God. And, uh, and I would go further than that. I would say that, that socialism is an idol uh, and an altar erected as rebellion against God. Uh, Marx did this quite consciously. He, he, you look at some of his early, early poetry, he was a hater of God, as Romans 1 um, would put it. So I think that we as a people... We need to become aware of who our enemies are and what it is they believe and why it's antithetical to the gospel. Well, you're coming out with a new book here soon called Around the World in More Than 80 Days, Discovering What Makes America Great and Why We Must Save It. What do you hope to communicate to, to the nation, to get people who get a hold of this book? Well, I appreciate you mentioning that book, and uh, I really hope people will buy it. Um, I was just told the other day that uh, Audible, uh, which has 90% of the audiobook market has refused to take the book on ideological grounds. Huh. Um, meaning that's where we are. They took my previous books, but they won't take this one um, because they feel so empowered. They don't have to take Christian or conservative authors anymore. Uh, so I don't even know if there will be an audio version of the book. And uh, Amazon has 95% of the book market now. 
And uh, Amazon is bumping off conservative authors um, uh, on their website, not 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 killing them. <laughs> maybe that's <laughs> they, next. But they maybe, certainly maybe are. Maybe that's yeah. next. But that uh, that book I wrote for this reason. I've done a lot of international travel um, in my life. I've been to some fifty five countries, and uh, I have interacted with um, with both the famous and the humble. I've uh, engaged with um, atheists and Muslims and persecuted Christians and um, with with uh, materialists and every sort as I travel around the world. And uh, what I what I discover is when I hear um, Black Lives Matter, when I hear um, Antifa, when I hear Democrats railing against America, that America is uh, such an awful place. Um, I have to ask myself a question. Um, ha- have you seen the rest of the world? <laughs> compared to what? Yeah. Yeah, compared to what? And so I'm grading on a curve as I, as I go around the world. America has her sins and her deep flaws, abortion chief among them. Um, but America is the freest country on the face of the earth. And so as I'm going around the world, I'm basically asking this question, um, you know, how does America stack up against the rest of the world? And why is it that there are North Koreas and Nigerias and Russias? And why is it that there's an America and a Britain and, and uh, others that we would point to? In other words, if human nature is the same the world over, and of course it is, how do we account for the fact that some societies are freer societies and value human life while there are others that don't? And uh, the answer to that is that there are those societies that are touched by the gospel to a greater degree and those that have not been touched by it, it seems, at all. And, uh, and the result is that those societies that have been touched by the gospel tend to be freer societies. They tend to be societies that have flourished economically, politically, in their art, in their literature. And then there are those that fall into a very different um, category there where life is extremely dangerous. Um, there's no rule of law. Um, and where people are, are treated as uh, counting for very little. And so this is the story I'm telling as I'm going around the world. Um, in this book, we, uh, we visited 27 countries, and uh, you get some of the adventure as we go along. I mean, I've shot AK-47s with uh, uh, former Viet Cong in uh, Vietnam. I rode elephants in Thailand. I, I repelled off the Great Wall of China. Um, I uh, debated Marx and Lenin impersonators in Red Square. You know, it's, some of it's quite funny and, and it's fun. And a couple of my boys went with me for part of the trip and it was quite an adventure. But I'm also making a very, very serious point that this country stands on the brink. And uh, Lincoln called us the last best hope on earth. And I believe that's what we are. Well, it requires a love of the land in order to be able to pray for it. And I think we need a revival of true patriotism. And I pray that book gives birth to a love for a nation and for country. I can't thank you enough for joining with me today. We need to have you back to delve a little more into this in the future, if you'll have us. Well, I'd be delighted to, Alan. It's great to be with you. Well, we're going to put links to all of your resources, your website, the upcoming book in the description below. We want every single one of our members to get a hold of those books and avail yourself to those resources. And we'll be right back after this. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this video. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, share. Your engagement helps us get the word out. But I've got an exciting announcement for you. Coming in 2021, in November of 2021, I'm going to be taking a tour group to Israel and to Greece as we walk in the footsteps of Jesus and in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul. This is going to be a life-changing experience. And to get more information, all you have to do is go to EncounterIsrael.org. This is more than a tour. It's a mission, and I believe it's going to change your life. Let's go together. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're back here with Larry Talton, and he's been talking with us about the battle between uh, Spurgeon and Karl Marx. And I want to talk with you just for a moment about this phrase, useful idiots. And you've, you've shown me there's a, there's a better term to be used, maybe a little more politically correct. But I feel like it's important for us to understand the historical nature. And I'm not using that term to be offensive at all, but I mean, I, I think many believers are falling into this trap, falling into this category. Could you give us a little bit of a background of that phrase and how we can keep from falling into it? 
Yeah, a, a conservative um, uh, economist by the name of Ludwig von Mises uh, used the term useful innocence. And um, uh, there's others, uh, some attribute the, the quotation to uh, Lenin. I don't actually think it was Lenin who said it. I do think it was Mises, von Mises, who said it. Uh, but there have been variations of it around for a, for a long time. But basically what, what Mises was talking about, in fact, I think he said it in reference to Lenin, is that, that strategists like a Lenin um, or a Marx, or in this case, Black Lives Matter or mm. uh, the Democratic Party, um, they are aware of the fact that there are those who take up their banner and carry it forward for them, not fully understanding the platform that they are they're lending their support to. Um, uh, for instance, I have a, uh, a couple of friends who have attended some of these Black Lives Matter um, protests. They're guys I like. They're, they're good guys. They're, they're not guys who are throwing bricks through windows. Um, they, are, they are people who are very compassionate people and very well-intentioned. I don't know if they're doing it now, but I know they did early on, you know, when this first began. And I would try to say to them, um, and, and in this case, I don't think it's because they're idiots. I think truly they're innocents. They're, yeah. they're people who don't realize what it is they're, they're supporting. We've all done it, you know, and unwittingly with any number of things that we just didn't understand what the context was in, in which we are, we're getting involved. And they see a, a, a protest, um, people gathering to support racial equality. And, you know, who can be against that? That looks that looks free and open and like a good thing I should support. What they don't understand is what's behind it. Hmm. And so um, the phrase, as, as Ludwig von Mises um, had it in mind, is guys like Lenin very deliberately put out a message. In his case, the Bolsheviks, uh, Lenin's phrase, which was very clever and caught on throughout Russia, peace, bread, land. Peace, bread, land. And uh, who could be against peace, bread, and land. I mean, no one's going to be against peace, bread, right. and land. So you're against peace, bread, and land? Um, if you will recall the debate over gay marriage, um, the uh, pollsters, uh, and don't think that homosexual activists weren't very aware of this, when they were calling Americans and asking them, are you in favor of gay marriage? Um, overwhelmingly, Americans said no. But when it was, the question was asked in a different way, are you in favor of privacy? Hmm. Are you in favor of love? Do you believe a person should be able to love whoever they want? Right. Americans suddenly began backpedaling on those kind of questions. And so what we're seeing right now is that they recognize they can hide their sordid agenda, which is about Marxism, which is about the destruction. Go to the Black Lives Matter website. I would encourage people who are watching, unless they've changed it, and I looked as recently as a couple of days ago, uh, if you go to the Black Lives Matter website, you'll see about us. And written in there is their view of the family. They seek to destroy the family. Mm -hmm. They seek to destroy um, uh, institutions as we currently understand them. They seek to basically wipe out the current social order. But my friends who've gone to some of these protests, would they be on board with all that? No. No. So they become useful innocents who um, carry the banner of racial equality, but what they don't know is that what's packaged inside of that, which is all this other crap, which is, you know, on the Black Lives Matter website, excuse me, but um, that's really what it is. <laughs> well, what can believers do? What are some act, pra practical things Christians can do, ministers can do to make a difference? Well, um, speaking for myself and uh, um, for the things that I see are around me, um, I think we need to repent. Hmm. Um, I think we need to repent of a, of, as a people for failing to make um, good use of the freedom and the wealth and the opportunities the Lord has given us for decades. Decades. We have squandered so much of our wealth. We have squandered so much of our time. Our Lord said we must work while it is day for night is coming in John chapter 9, verse 4. Well, that is, it's dusk now. <laughs> and uh, we must really be working. I think I, I wouldn't begin to prepare to tell all pastors exactly what they need to do beyond preaching the gospel. 
uh, which means preaching sin, repentance, grace, uh, hell, heaven, uh, the hope of eternity, the hope that Jesus Christ is our only hope. It's not to be found in, uh, in men and in, in uh, um, failed philosophies like Marxism. And I think we need to be organizing and pushing back at uh, some of this, and uh, in some cases, um, quite literally pushing back. I, I think Americans must be prepared to defend themselves. Now, I'm not calling on uh, for violence here, but I do believe that there's a place for civil disobedience. I think there is a place for us to rightfully defend ourselves. I, I was somebody who early on, when all of this um, uh, the concern over the, the Chinese coronavirus broke, mm -hmm. And there was a call for quarantines. I saw many Christians who were immediately calling for civil disobedience. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. We need to be obedient to our governments, and right. we need to wait and see what we're dealing with. But I, you know, now, here we are several months later, I'm very supportive of John MacArthur, yeah. who just this past week said, no, we're going to church. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's because we're seeing what Democrats and uh, the radical left are doing. We saw this extraordinary um, four-hour, five-hour-long funeral for John Lewis, um, a mass gathering, mass protests, mass riots. Um, and while the churches are being told that they can't gather or they can only gather in small numbers and schools can't meet and restaurants can't be open and businesses are being destroyed, no, I think the time has come to move on from those things and uh, uh, and to respectfully um, disobey. Protestants need to get back to their roots. Yes. Well, there we go. The term was originated in uh, the Diet of Spire in 1529. So, yes, we need to become um, Protestants um, once more. And uh, I think we need to become very aware of who our enemies are. We need to know what Marxism is. I've been... I've spent, I, I had to read it in graduate school. I had to read Capital, uh, Das Kapital. I had to read uh, um, uh, The Communist Manifesto. This past week, I reread it. Hmm. And I've spent my morning, um, the last two days, I've spent rereading the poetry of Karl Marx. It's, uh, it's shocking stuff where he says, I'll, almost in the words of Satan, I shall make myself like the most high and put my throne above his throne. This is the kind of stuff that he's saying. Um, I'm, I could say that I'm pretty well versed in Marxism, and yet I find myself saying, I need to know more. I need to, I need to root out more about mm. who this man is, and um, I find myself rereading some of the memoirs of people who lived uh, under Marxist regimes and conversing with those who, um, you know, who were there. And uh, I think these are things we need to begin doing, and I, I think we begin to, be, begin to um uh, we need to begin mobilizing as a people. Um, do we outnumber Black Lives Matter? Absolutely. But right now, it's a case of the tail wagging the dog, and where we're all cowering in the trenches. Uh, I think our situation is is exactly like that, where where David arrives on the field of battle and he sees he sees the uh, the Israelites cowering, and he says, mm -hmm. "Who's this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God?" Um, we're the armies of the living God. Uh, let's start acting like it. Uh, let's start behaving like we we actually have the God of the universe who said, let there be light on our side. And let's begin to to act with that kind of confidence rather than being pushed around. Well, for pastors out there, I implore you, many of you who are watching right now, I, I need you to know that you may ask what relevance does this have biblically? Adam, the first man, is mentioned 50 times. The Antichrist is mentioned more than 100, and his system is a socialistic Marxist style system. And the Bible says, though that man is not here yet, his spirit is operating in the earth today. And a lot of what we're seeing is that antichrist system, that antichrist spirit at work in the earth right now. And we're not supposed to be ignorant concerning his devices. Larry, Amen. thank you so much for joining us today. How can our folks get a hold of you? How can they find you? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at, uh, at Larry Taunton. And they can also find me on my website, uh, Larry Alex Taunton, that's T-A-U-N-T-O-N, LarryAlexTaunton.com. And I think you have a YouTube channel too, don't you? I do. We have the, the Fixed Point Foundation. Many of you are aware of the Fixed Point Foundation. In fact, if you type in fixed-point.org, it'll take you to LarryAlexTaunton.com. And you'll find there all our debates, my debates with Christopher Hitchens, our, our debates between Lennox and Dawkins and uh, uh, you name it, they're all there. 
tremendous. They've been around the world and I encourage all of our viewers to avail yourself to those resources, like, share as much as you can repeatedly, and make sure you're engaged in what we're talking about today. Larry, thank you again so much. Thank you, brother. Good to be with you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to your encounter today. Now, tonight, we're diving head first into the controversies of the hour. We're going to be talking about the Pledge of Allegiance. We're going to be talking about the 1619 Project, the Founding Fathers, and all of those questions are going to be answered, but we want to hear from you. What do you think about these issues? And we want to know where you're watching from. So make sure you write in the comments there and tell us where, we're, where you're watching from. It thrills us to know that people are watching all over the world. And I think tonight you're going to be especially blessed. Tonight I'm joined by a very special guest. He has consulted governments. He, had, he has advised political parties, started Christian schools. He worked with Kirk Cam Cameron on the tremendous film Monumental. He's authored numerous books. He's the president of the Providence Foundation. Actually, he's authored one of my favorite history books, America's Providential History. Would you give a great big encounter today welcome to Mr. Stephen McDowell. Stephen, it's good to have you with us today. Well, it's great to be with you. Well, let's dive right in because there's a lot to talk about and I, and I want to I want to utilize my time with you as good as possible. Today we seem to have kind of a flippant look at history. And so I wanted to ask you really what difference does it make? Why does our perception of this nation founding even matter? Well, you know, seeds produce fruit. The seed you start with determines the fruit that's produced. America has been and is the most free, prosperous, just nation in the history of mankind. Not perfect. We certainly had our problems. And so to have such great fruit, which by the way, still attracts millions of people who are trying to immigrate here. They want to live here because they want to live under this fruit of liberty. Mm -hmm. But, but to, you, we must understand what produced these seeds that produced this great fruit. And history clearly reveals that biblical Christianity is the source of the ideas that gave birth to this free nation of America. So if we don't understand the source of our liberty, then we will readily throw it away. And that's what's happening today. As our government schools have taught a false idea of the founding of America, we think it's, you know, our own great wisdom or, or actually what they're centering in on today is the sins of our founders, that we're a rotten nation and nothing is good about us. Then we're going to try to reject everything that our founders gave us and embrace other ideas Unfortunately, those ideas will not produce liberty, justice, and prosperity, but uh, a bondage, lack, and oppression. So it makes all the difference in the world to what America becomes in the future. It seems that we really have a narrow view of history. I was sharing this with someone the other day. We tend to look at history as if it all occurred in one day with all the same people. And so we blame the pilgrims for what privateers did years later. When we're looking at what's taking place today, you know, there's a, there's a lot of rewriting of the history with the, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the 1619 Project, which is really an anti-American organization that's, I believe, operating in more than 3,500 schools right now that are basically teaching people that America is fundamentally racist, that therefore its documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are racist. And they claim without citation that the American Revolution was in part fault to preserve slavery. So there's a lot of rewriting of history today. So I wanted to go back with you just for a few minutes and let's let's go back to when they landed on Plymouth Rock. Let's talk about the pilgrims. Were they self-seeking white supremacist or was there something else going on with them? Well, every American ought to study the pilgrims. They're a marvelous example of men and women of Christian character. Uh, the, in our book, America's Providential History, we have many pages just on the pilgrims, by the way, in the words of one of the pilgrims, William Bradford, mm. who served as their governor 33 years, wrote the first great historical and literary work in American history called Of Plymouth Plantation. And when you read through that, or the excerpts, just the excerpts we have in our book, 
uh, it clearly reveals here were a people who were devoted to the Lord, that they were enlightened by the Word of God when they lived back in England in the late 1500s and early 1600s. They got access to the Bible. They began to read the Bible, and it transformed their life, first their heart, they were transformed. Then as they began to study and read the Bible, their mind was transformed and their whole motive, we want to follow the will of God. So they were forced to flee England because of oppression and they didn't have the ability to freely worship God for 12 years. They found refuge in Holland. And then in 1620, some, well, only some 50 of them or so made their way to the new world, but they came and Bradford is clear about this. They came to find a place where they could more freely worship God, to propagate the gospel. Lastly, in which was not least a great hope and inward zeal they had of laying some good foundation or to make some way thereunto for the advancing and the propagating of the Christian religion, as Bradford wrote. And by the way, that quote from him is engraved upon the base of a statue of Bradford in Plymouth, Massachusetts today. But you, if you look at their life, read what they said, what you see is there's a, a people who love God, a people of, of Christian character that is unsurpassed by anyone today, and, and uh, you can't help but fall in love with these people. But Americans don't know anything about the pilgrims. They're not, they don't even know of the book of Plymouth Plantation hmm. because those who do not like God and his truth have to cut us off from our true history in order to sell us a false narrative, which is what the 1619 Project is. It's, it's just an untrue history over and over and over again with false suppositions, a lot of lies, and everything else. So these people, the pilgrims, were, were, were uh, those, we, every American should be taught about uh, these, the fathers, the parents of our republic, as one historian called them. Well, the enemy knows that any people who don't know their history are easily deceived. And right now, there's an effort to rewrite history, I, I believe, in order to add validity to the argument of separation of church and state and, and to kind of whitewash our past in order to reform it. But as we move forward with this, where are they getting the idea when we're dealing with the 1619 Project? When they look at the pilgrims, they don't, they, obviously they don't understand Puritanism when they talk about slavery. I have a lot of writings from the Puritans. Some of my favorite readings are from Puritan writers. These are very anti-slavery people who came to the United yes. States. Exactly. And the pilgrims were anti-slavery. There's a, a, an attempt to, to sell some slaves to the pilgrims in their early uh, years, and they rejected it. So, you know, we, we are uh, opposed to it. You know, um, the pilgrims were some of the, the, the Puritans of New England passed some of the first anti-slavery laws in history. Hmm. You know, slavery was something that has existed since the fall of man. Every nation has had slavery. Every people has enslaved other people. And it was only with the birth of America, which was based upon biblical ideas and the teaching of Christ in the Bible, that there's all men are equal before, for, before God and God's law and have equal status and rights before their creator, it was people who embraced this Christian worldview that began to apply the principles of equality and they began to write uh, uh, laws of liberty for all men. And, uh, and after our independence, before our independence, we were really limited in what we could do because, um, in fact, in 1774, Thomas Jefferson wrote an anti and folks in Virginia wrote anti-slavery legislation forbidding the selling of slaves in America and the king in, in Virginia and the king vetoed it. So before independence there were steps taken but it was limited what could be done but after independence here this Christian people then could began to take action to deal with this social evil that had plagued mankind since the very beginning and they did begin to take steps. Half the states outlawed slavery within Within uh, 20 years, the slave trade was, was ended as the constitutional provision provided for it. Washington signed the first anti-slavery federal piece of legislation in the, of the Northwest Ordinance, which forbid slavery in the new territories of the Northwest, which was then Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, that area. 
So they began to take steps to deal uh, to deal with uh, this evil, and so people like in the 1619 project, I don't, you know, some a lot of some of them are ignorant, and some of them have their own set of presuppositions that they want to uh, impose upon the American people. But usually, the way the enemy works in uh, attacking our history is that he'll take an element of truth, five or ten percent at the most, surround it with a bunch of lies, and then feed it to the American people. And there are many examples of that. So there might be an element of truth in what some of these people say, but then right. it's distorted with many lies. The context is not given. The whole story is not told. And when you learn that, you begin to see, oh, it's not like they are saying at all. Well, it's interesting you mentioned earlier the source material. You can tell when you're talking with someone who's read the source material and who's read what someone else said about the source material. And it was similar with Frederick Douglass, who had a certain opinion of the Declaration of Independence until he went and read it for himself. When we're dealing with the founding of America and our founding fathers, were these men self-seeking? Were they were they just desiring their own personal wealth, or or did they have a greater vision? Uh, I heard someone say the other day. The reason why I'm asking this, uh, and it was a prominent international minister, and others have come out and said it. The Fourth of July is not my Independence Day because when they declared independence, I wasn't free. And my response to that was, well, neither were they. It was a declaration of faith. They were laying out a value and a principle to live up to, not one that they currently possessed, but one that they were reaching for. Yeah, and th these were the least self-seeking guys that you could find. You know, it's interesting when when they affix their signature on the Declaration of Independence, there's the anecdotal story that that uh, uh, John Hancock, who was president of the, of the Continental Congress that signed the Declaration, he signed in big letters. He said, now the king can read my name without glasses <laughs> and he can double the price on my head. Because these men wrote about the fact they recognized we're not signing this because we're going to be famous, we're going to be great, they're going to read about us in the future in textbooks. They were s signing what they thought was their own death warrant. They recognized that we are up against the greatest military power in history. We are declaring here we are the chief rebels, our name's on this document, we cannot hide. They knew that the king and it was specifically go after them and their families and their property. In fact, many of them suffered greatly and lost property and family and many other things uh, when, in, by what they did. But, uh, but they were doing this for posterity. They were doing this with us in mind, their children and their children's children, recognizing we may never really truly benefit from the great sacrifices that we're making to stand up for principles and, and, and form a whole new uh, government. We're doing that for posterity. And hopefully they said that posterity will value the great liberty that we've given so much to possess and that they want give it away. But unfortunately, since we don't know the price of our liberty, we've uh, squandered it. We've given it away. And this is not, you know, when you look at the history of the world, most men throughout most of history and most nations have not lived free. They've lived in bondage. They lived under ruler's law where the, the ruler has imposed upon them whatever he considered to be, to be law. In the United States, something new and unique was taking place, and it's those principles of the Declaration of Independence that ultimately prevailed to eliminate slavery, to to uh, increase the standing of women in society, and every other thing. That it, it took some time for the, those to begin to be equitably established and applied to all, but it has. And this is what, as you mentioned earlier, Frederick Douglass, upon first reading, thought, you know, the Constitution, Declaration, you know, I don't think so highly of them, but he began to study it and recognize, well, I was wrong. And, and a lot of people are quoting from his first uh, address, his first July 4th oration, which right. he later modified to explain that now I see that it's a great document of liberty, a document of freedom. And it's that document that has given freedom to those who were formerly slaves in America. 
Frederick Douglass' position, interestingly enough, very similar to Martin Luther King Jr.'s position, was not to denigrate the flag, but to stand under it and to exalt it and say, we're not living up to the principles uh, that this flag represents. And one of my recommendations for people who want to protest is, instead of kneeling, get yourself a step stool and stand higher for the flag. And if you do that, you'll have more people rallying around you. And right now, I, I saw this before we came on the air tonight, the Los Angeles Times, along with many others, are saying that we need to eliminate the Pledge of Allegiance and replace it with something like, lean on me, because there seems to be some quote unquote problematic verses in the uh, second verse of the song, and people seem to have issues with Francis Scott Key, and, and I think people are making concessions saying, well, you know, we understand that there are issues with the author or with the second verse, and they're trying to be sympathetic, but they're conceding ground that doesn't need to be conceded. Could you talk to us a little bit about the, uh, play, or excuse me, the national anthem and uh, Francis Scott Key? You know, the national anthem has numerous verses. We are familiar with the first one because we sing it at sporting events, or at least we used to. But the first verse ends with a question. Oh, say, can you see that it Star Spangled Banner? He's a, Francis Scott Key was asking the question as he was in the ship out in the harbor looking at the bombardment of Fort McHenry, does the flag still wave hmm. over the land of the free? And in the last next three verses, he answers the question. And in the fourth verse, it speaks about you know, how we are a heaven rescued land, that we are to praise the power that has preserved and made us a nation, then conquer we must when our cause it is just, and this be our motto, and God is our trust. I wish we'd sing all the verses, but yeah. a lot of the people want to get rid of that and the Pledge of Allegiance because it acknowledges God, it acknowledges mm -hmm. the source of our liberty, our independence, the foundation of America, so they're going to do everything they can Let's get rid of any mention of God and let's replace it with, now lean on me is, helps typify what really in the large picture, what's going on in America. And that is this, that we are changing gods, hmm. uh, which is reflected through changing laws. Someone once said that the fundamental question every society should ask is who is the source of the law of a society. This is a fundamental question because the source of the law of a society is the God of that society. The source of the law in America used to be the Bible. It's very clear. Just go read the early constitutions, compacts, and charters. 86 were written in colonial America. About 20 others were written in England. All of those uh, mention God in his higher law as as the source of law for mankind. So the God of the Bible used to be the God of America reflected in our laws. And in some sense, he still is, but we have been changing that. We have been putting aside the absolute law of the creator, and we have substituted evolutionary law that originates from the consensus of man. Uh, we will become our own source of law, our mm. own source of right and wrong. In the 1920s, Roscoe Pound was the president of Harvard Law School. Now, he recognized the Christian foundation of law in America. He did not attack it directly. In fact, he said, you know, it's been good. It's a, that Christian foundation of our law has enabled us to progress and grow to this point in our history and it's been beneficial. But, he said, it's not good enough to take us into the future. If we really want to continue to advance, we need to put aside that Christian foundation and substitute in its place the consensus of man. And then his quote was that in this situation, the state takes the place of Jehovah. Yeah. And so we have been putting aside the absolutes of God's law. and We've looked to man via the state as the source of our law. So when we, if we were to sing, lean on me, that reflects modern evolutionary secular man. They think we are our own savior. We can save ourselves. We know what's best. We know how to choose between good and evil which, by the way, was the original sin of Adam and Eve. When God told them, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in Genesis 3, 5, 
when they did eat of it, they in essence were saying, we want to determine for ourselves what is good and evil. Lord, we don't like your choice. We think we can do better. And that's been the sin of man ever since. And we're doing that today. We're rejecting God's standard of right and wrong, of morality and immorality, of truth. And we're saying, we think consensus of man. We think we can do it. We think we're really this, a lot of the secularists think that select few smart people who went to Harvard or Princeton, you know, who have, sit in the seat of power of government. We can decide. We know better than, than uh, God himself. So um, that suggestion for a new national anthem or new pledge of allegiance or you know, new laws or whatever it is, it's just a, a, a continual uh, application of this bigger picture of of changing gods reflected in changing laws. It's interesting because many, many ministers like myself, we want to stand against bigotry, against intolerance, against racism. We want to stand against injustice. But at the same time, we see these, these outrages, these social justice issues being used, as you said, as a Trojan horse, really, to shove in anti-God, anti-Christ agendas. And I wonder if ministers today are getting it. When you look across the landscape, and I know in in your new book uh, that's called Ruling Over the Earth, A Biblical View of Civil Government, you you talk about the minister's role. How are ministers reacting today? Are they engaging in social issues or are they opting out because virtue signaling costs much less than actually standing for biblical truth? Well, some are awakening, but not enough. Hmm. You know, it's interesting. I think Barna did a survey a few years ago and asked evangelical pastors, do you believe the Bible speaks to all of life? And 90% of them said, yes, we believe the Bible has principles that speak to every sphere of life. Yet, only 10% of them ever teach or preach on kind of general biblical worldview on how the Bible speaks, not just to personal matters of faith and our relationship to God, which are obviously very important, but how does the Bible address, you know, these civil issues, civil government and race relations and what's going on in our nation today? Uh, What does the Bible have to say about that? Most of them never teach about it. So they may say they believe the Bible speaks to all of life, but if they don't apply that, in their ministry, then they really don't believe it at all. So I think that kind of typifies the state of the church. I've been teaching on these things for about 40 years, and when I first started, uh, there were not many at all, many much of the church in, in America, and there were not many books regarding uh, you know, the Bible impacting uh, civic life. And there's a whole lot more today, a whole lot more people and ministries and materials uh, that teach on this. So this is good news. I think this does reflect an awakening, understanding that uh, our mission as Christians is not just to convert men, but it's to transform nations, transform society. Uh, that, you know, that, that great commission of Jesus has two parts. We're to go and redeem men because he's, he's given us the redemption mandate, the evangelistic mandate. But we're also to do what the original mission God gave to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28, to be fruitful, rule over the earth, subdue the earth, take dominion over the earth. We are to rule over the earth. So the original mission that God gave to mankind is for us to govern the earth, govern everything within in the earth. So certainly we got to be involved in civil government if we're going to do that. And, and, and for various reasons that we outline in our book, America's Providential History, the church that used to do that, like the Pilgrims and the Puritans and, and the early founding of America, they understood this and they took those principles and sought to build a whole new society based upon biblical truth. They formed the foundation of this, of this nation of America. But in recent century, century and a half, we've rejected a lot of those things, and we have thought, well, the Bible just deals with personal matters. It's this pietistic gospel. The kingdom of God only deals with theological matters and our relationship to him. Consequently, we have preached a truncated gospel message Mm -hmm. and have left to the secular, the ungodly, to run 
the government, run the schools, run the economies, run the media and Hollywood and everything else. And so we're just experiencing the fruit of those thorns and thistles that have been planted in generations past. It was years ago that I first learned about the Black Robe Regiment by reading America's Providential History, and that started my journey in digging into it. And recently, I've been calling for a revival of the Black Robe Regiment because ministers have been the hinge upon which, it seems, the liberty of this nation has swung since its very beginning. I wonder if you could take a minute. I've been surprised by the people who don't know anything about the Black Robe Regiment and talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, John Adams, who was our second president, was once asked, well, who are the founding fathers of America? And he began to list a bunch of ministers, Reverend Mm -hmm. Jonathan Mayhew, Reverend Samuel Cooper, and others. He said, these have to be part of those who are the founding fathers of America. And it's certainly true that that, that, that the clergy, the pastors, the ministers were watchmen on the walls. They understood that their mission was was yes to train individuals in their personal knowledge and relationship with Christ but also to disciple the nation at large as Jesus gave them in the Great Commission so they did that it was pastors who colonized the states they wrote our laws and constitutions they started our schools and colleges they served as is the primary teachers in the colleges in and in, in, in schools they they served as presidents of most almost all the universities up until the end of the 1800s and and uh, many of them were involved in civil government directly, like John Witherspoon, who was a signer of the Declaration. He was the president of Princeton University. And, and by the way, he provides a good example of how the ministers pastored America. I'll tell you his story in a minute. But the Black Robe Regiment was the title that the British gave to some of the pastors in America, a lot of those a lot were Presbyterian, kind of reformed thinking pastors who recognize we have to be a voice in in, in the, these civil affairs. And they gave, they were called the Black Robe Regiment in reference to the color of the pulpit gowns that many of them would wear when they get in the pulpit to preach a, a sermon. And they were uh, some of the, along with the signers of the Declaration, they were some of the chief of the rebels in the eyes of the king because of the great... Uh, leadership they provided in teaching truth to the people and being involved directly in praying for the troops out in the field when fighting started. And many of them entered directly into civil affairs, fighting in, in, in the war and other things. But, but to, you know, John Witherspoon, who I mentioned, was the president of Princeton University. He came from Scotland in the uh, 1760s to assume the, the uh, presidency. And um, he began to train in Princeton. Of course, schools back then were much different than today. There was maybe 50 students at Princeton at the time. And he didn't just show up a couple of days a week and give a lecture and you never saw him again. It was a discipling process and, and, and pouring his life into, into these uh, individuals who many became uh, pulpit ministers, but many became civil ministers. And one gentleman who came to study under him was, uh, you know, Princeton was in New Jersey, it was then called the College of New Jersey. Now we know it as Princeton University, but one young man from Virginia, not far from where I live, his mother uh, wanted to send him up to study under John Witherspoon. She liked his idea, so instead of going to the College of William and Mary, like most Virginians, he went there to school. And he Intended, he studied theology, tended to go into the ministry, but was so impressed with the ideas of civil liberty that he learned from John Witherspoon, he went on to serve in the public arena. This man, James Madison, became the chief architect of the Constitution and the fourth president of the United States. He was trained by John Witherspoon, this minister. But Witherspoon not only trained one president, he trained one vice president, three Supreme Court justices, 12 governors, many who served in the cabinet, and 16 different congressmen. One-fifth of the signers of the Declaration, one-sixth of the members of the Constitutional Convention uh, were trained by John Witherspoon. So this man literally discipled his nation. This is what the church and pastors and leadership in the church should be doing today. They should be raising up leaders in every area of life, civil government, 
pulpit ministry, business, uh, media, and arts, in every area, teaching them biblical truth, how to reason from the Bible to those areas, because they believed that the Bible contains truth, that if you apply the principles in the Bible, you will get good fruit. You will have liberty, justice, prosperity. You'll have all the, the blessings that God promises when we obey Him. And so uh, he's a great example of how ministers disciple the nation. And, uh, and because of this, the British recognized this is the source hmm. of, of what they thought was their problems. It was the ministers teaching ideas that really overthrew the crown rights of the king. You know, he thought that the view was that you know, I'm the source of God's voice on the earth. That's kind of the divine right of kings idea that had been established in the centuries past in, in Europe. God speaks to the king and the king then declares to all the people really what the voice of God is. But <clears throat> these ministers taught, uh, no, we all are priests, prophets, and kings. We all can hear from God directly and that uh, we can understand his will and act upon it. And no man is above the law that we are directly accountable to God himself. So they were just applying theological truth in the civil arena. And this was one of the foundational principles of the American form of government. Well, it seems every step that ministers take away from involvement in civil government is a a step this nation takes away from liberty, and I've I've spoken with pastors. I used to think it was it was just cowardice that kept people from speaking and getting involved. I've come to understand that really is an ignorance that they really believe a lot of what they've learned in the public schools or however they were educated in their Christian schools. And uh, I was speaking with one pastor, several pastors, but one in particular, and uh, I was talking with him about this. He said, "Well, when we're dealing with government." Christians shouldn't be allowed to pray by themselves in Congress or in some governmental position because we're a multicultural society, and if you give a Christian the right to pray, then you have to give the Muslim the right to pray. Is that pray? Is that is that right, or are we missing something? Well, every nation in the world is built upon some religion. This is an unescapable fact of history. Now, whether that be the Muslim religion. Mm -hmm. uh, could be Catholic Christianity, Protestant Christianity, uh, could be secularism, atheism, that's a religion. Even the court ruled that that's a religion, Hinduism, Buddhism. So every nation is built upon a set of presuppositions that are rooted in what a people consider to be ultimate. There's no such thing as neutrality in life, neutrality in regards to religion as it applies to, to government. Now, that's an important concept to understand because in the United States, the founders recognized we are going to build our nation upon biblical Christianity. It's going to be reflected in our laws, our institutions, our, our basic presuppositions uh, about life. And so when you read the Declaration of Independence, it's our founding covenant. Now, again, you look at that declaration, you should read all the, the, the founding documents for all yes. 13 colonies, which are some are even more specifically biblical Christian than the Declaration. And so, but we uh, adhere to a set of truths. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So we believe there is truth. That truth is rooted in the Creator. We're endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, summarized by our right to life, liberty, and property, the pursuit of happiness, which is the pursuit of doing the will of God. And uh, these are our fundamental tenets with a firm reliance upon the protection of divine providence. So our covenant document that formed this nation is an acknowledgement of the God of the Bible. And the Constitution does this too. The Constitution is just the bylaws of that covenant. And so if, if we want to reject the Christian foundation, uh, constitutionally or legally, we have to do it in a legal manner. There is a means of changing our constitution. It's very difficult. It's the amendment process. And as of yet, we have not amended the constitution to reject this, the, this Christian covenant. And so because of that, Christianity is still, in a sense, the 
the, the principles of Christianity are the established religion of the United States, not in the sense of established religion of what they had in Europe where you had a national church. Right. For centuries, you had all Europe had national churches where one specific church or denomination received preference from others. In America, uh, you had you had each colony, by the way, eight of the well, eight of the thirteen colonies had a specific denomination. Christian denomination is the established religion. Four others had general Protestant Christianity as the established religion. Uh, but in the the nation at large, we they the founder said we recognize. Christian belief, Christian foundations, general biblical concepts. We embrace that. We don't embrace a national church. Uh, so there was a jurisdictional separation of the institution of the church with the institution of civil government. That's what they would have meant. They didn't really use the phrase separation of church and state. Jefferson used it in a letter he wrote in 1802. But but, uh, but they believed in a jurisdictional separation of the function of civil government and the function of the church. Both are divine institutions, along with the family, and that they have specific purposes and duties, and that one should not encroach upon uh, the other. But, or, or put it this way, some say, you know, you, you, uh, you, we sh God should have nothing to do with public life. That's the modern concept of the separation of church and state. Well, this is an impossible idea. God is sovereign over all nations, mm -hmm. over all governments. You can't separate God from government. So uh, God has everything to do with public life. Uh, um, so you can't separate him from that, but there is a jurisdictional separation of what the church is supposed to do and what the state is supposed to do. And uh, if the state, if one of those usurps the authority of the other, then the result of that is uh, tyranny. So I think I'm giving you a long answer to your question. The question is, you know, sh can should we pray in a Christian prayer? Well, in the United States, that is the our uh, preferential faith that we have acknowledged the God of the Bible is the source of our law, of our institutions. Uh, our proclamations, we have hundreds and hundreds of governmental proclamations that acknowledge Jesus Christ and his truth. And so our whole history has been that, that we recognize we are a Christian land, a Christian nation in the sense we're founded upon biblical principles. And that we can, if we reject that, then we won't be the America that we know. Well, Christianity seems to be the only worldview that allows for the free practice of every other worldview, which which brings us to a lot of what's happening in America today. A lot of the symbols, Christian symbols, as well as political symbols, are being torn down. Monuments are being defaced all across the nation in these in a lot of these riots. And I wanted to ask you about this, and you can you can punt if you want to, but in, in defense of the monuments, I see a lot of people jumping to speak about defending Thomas Jefferson or George Washington, but but the core of the issue really starts with the Confederate monuments. And I wanted to ask your question ask you a question about that. What do you think about the Confederate monuments? Should they remain? And if so, why? Well, that's a large question that uh, I wish we had about an hour to, to answer that thoroughly. Um, you know, the whole war between the states, Confederacy, is part of our history. It's one that we haven't taught accurately as we haven't taught the founding of America accurately or anything else. So if you don't understand what's going on, what are the principles, how God, how is God at work in this, uh, then, then you're not going to be able to understand the modern conflict that we have, and it takes more than just a you know a pious platitude or a phrase to understand that whole issue. So, in our book, America's Providential History, we actually do have a chapter on the war between the states and try to answer the question, why? What's going on here? And uh, so, it, it, it's. Uh, it reminds us of our history. There was a conflict that that occurred. Good and bad came out of the the war between the states. And uh, I have no problem with preserving, uh, you know, monuments to people who fought in North and South uh, to, as a as a way to help 
spur us on. All right, well, let's learn the story. What's going on here? Why do you have in a Christian nation, because America's birth is a Christian nation, why do you have Christian fighting against Christian? Right. I mean, it, sh- it really should never be because our founders believe that a just war and a defensive cause is sinless before God. Now, of course, the war between the states was not, it, Lincoln sent the troops into the South, not having anything to do with ending slavery, but serve the Union. And so it, 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 what initiated that was the preservation of the Union. Now, of course, tied up in that was the whole concept of, of uh, slavery. Now, I could launch out and begin to give, uh, you know, just a brief overview of what happened in the war. If you would like for me to do to do that, it'd take a few minutes. I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, to do that. We've got as much time as you want. We certainly would. If you want to do a separate video sometime, we can do that as well. But uh, it's a fascinating uh, topic. Uh, yes, it is. And here's how in my, my brief few minute uh, overview of this, this is how I uh, would present it. America's birth is a Christian nation. This is a clear concept that anybody who studies the founding documents knows that. Not perfect. That doesn't mean it's perfect, but they look to God of the Bible as the ultimate source of authority and attempted to apply his principles not only in their public life and their family life, but in civil life as well. So as a Christian nation, you know, the founders, uh, many of them recognize, all right, we've got, here's a social evil, slavery that has existed since the fall of man. We believe God wants us to do something about it, to show the rest of the world how a Christian nation deals with this uh, evil institution. And they began to take steps, as I said earlier, uh, 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 northern states outlawed slavery, and Mm -hmm. many of the slave owners like Washington who inherited slaves, he bought some when he was young, but then he developed the conviction it's wrong, never bought any more. He set his slaves free in his will. You have examples like that, but you had some men who, uh, you know, unredeemed men who who uh, tried to justify slavery as well, though they were in a minority. The majority of the founding fathers of America were anti-slavery and started an anti-slavery institutions. So they began to take steps for a generation or more. They actually advanced. In fact, I believe that the founding fathers did more than any other group of people up until that time in history to take steps to end slavery. Could they have done more? Certainly. Did they do nothing? Not at all. I don't know of any other a nation that had done as much as they did. No one ended the slave trade uh, like they did. Now, of course, England, due to the influence of Christians, William Wilberforce and the Clapham sect of pastors, they went on to peaceably in the slave trade and then later in slavery in itself. America had started to do that prior to England doing it. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, when you get to the generation after the founding fathers, to those steps to end this, uh, this evil, since they did not, then God intervened. And we had a war uh, which brought judgment on both North and South. Both were guilty in different ways in this. And even in the midst of the judgment of God, great revival took place. They were in the Southern Army. There were estimated 150,000 troops got saved in the Southern Army. Many Christian generals fought for the South, like Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson. That's why I like their statues. All right, let's read about these men. What did they do? They, they weren't fighting to preserve slavery. Lee said, look, if it was up to me, I would set every slave free in the South. And and I don't. he didn't think South Carolina ever se- should have seceded. So he was not, uh, and same with Stonewall Jackson. They, he was teaching slaves in, uh, in his church uh, he, uh, in Virginia, you know, truth of the Bible. Illegally. When, when even, yeah, even his church said, you can't do this. So, so here were Christian men who got caught up uh, in this uh, thing, who were fighting to defend their own homeland from invasion. This is how they would look at it. And uh, so we had this war, judgment came, and through it all, uh, with, with great hardship to the, to the American people, especially the South, one in seven adult men in the South, capable of bearing children, were killed during the war. So it was devastating mm. uh, 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 <clears throat> judgment of God that came, yet... The Union was preserved and slavery was outlawed. The principles of the Declaration 
uh, exerted themselves and brought forth equality and liberty for all ind individuals because of that. That's the positive. The negative consequence of the war, at least one, is that centralization of power uh, came to the national government unlike anything before. You know, before the war, we used to write the United States of America R because of the diversity of the colonies. We were colonies had most of the power and the national government had limited powers. 18 as enumerated in the Constitution in Article 1. After the war, we used to say the United States of America is. Now the emphasis mm. was upon the one. So that, that was one unique aspect of the American form of government is this concept of federalism, that there were two separate, in a way, kind of sovereign entities operating upon governmental bodies operating upon each individual. You had the states and the localities where most of the power rests, and you had the national government as well. So we had to kind of, after the war, the balance began to shift to the national government. And ever since, it's gotten more and more and more. In early America, almost all the power, Amendments 9 and 10 of the Constitution, rested with the people or the states. After the war, it came to the point where all authority and power rested with the national government. And if they are nice, they'll let the states and localities exercise some authority and power. That's one of the reasons and why course, I believe Lincoln struggled with the 13th Amendment, because uh, he certainly wanted to make sure slaves were free, but he was concerned about giving the federal government that much power over the states. Yeah, and, and that's exactly right. In fact, Lincoln struggled with the idea. He didn't he didn't, one, constitutionally think he could deal with the institution of slavery. It was a that social evil that each state needed to be dealt with. And he was also concerned, you know, about sending troops to preserve the Union. He wasn't, he felt, well, I've got to do it. Wasn't quite sure because if you have to use force to preserve a Union, it's not really a Christian Union. So mm. <clears throat> that compromise came about because individuals in America began to lose their self government lose their virtue and morality, which are the essential foundations for any free nation. And any time a people lose those Christian virtues, then it's going to lead to problems. And it did in the United States with the war and, and throughout the 20th century, it has led to further centralization of power and loss of individual liberty. Well, you talk about in America's providential history, the seven principles of liberty. We often look at liberty today, and I'm, I've just had uh, meetings with pastors this week, and we seem to have to kind of, as I said earlier, a flippant view of it, that it's just here, it would be here whether America was here or not. But I view liberty as kind of like going up a down escalator. If you're not making an exerted effort, you're going in the opposite direction. It is a, it's a miracle that we have the liberty we have today. And in those seven principles, you talk about self-government, you talk about Christian character, and particularly one of them was Christian education. And is, do you think that's one of the roots of the problems we're facing in America today, a breakdown in our educational system? Yeah, it is probably the most central reason for the secularization of America. The early Americans who were biblically minded, they recognize that it's the parents' right and responsibility to govern the education of their children. Parents are primarily responsible to train up their children in the way that they should go to instill in them biblical truth, biblical character, the ability to reason from the Bible to all of life. Secondarily, the church can assist them in this mission by setting up schools and, and other things. In fact, the early colleges in America were started for this reason. They started by the church or for Christians to train godly ministers and train all people how to reason biblically. So for the first few centuries, 106 of the first 108 colleges were founded by and for the Christian faith. In 1860, there were 247 colleges in America, all but maybe a dozen, 12 to 15 of those were founded on the Christian faith. And, uh, but then what happened as we began to put aside a biblical understanding and, and we see the rise of secularism in many areas, but primarily rise of secularism in education. And so we began to turn over to the state the governance of educating our children. 
in 1830s, Horace Mann, borrowing the Prussian model of education, set up state education in Massachusetts. And over the next hundred years, about every state began to follow suit. And so by the 1930s, you had in every state, state compelled, state mandated, state governed education. Now, when Horace Mann set up state education, he didn't throw out the Bible. The Bible is still there being taught uh, because of its central influence in America. But gradually, as the model of education, that is, who is to educate, shifted from the private sector to the government, then what followed is the philosophy. We rejected the biblical model. Now we reject the biblical philosophy. No longer was the Bible the central text. Uh, that what was taught, it became one text of many, and then beginning in the 1960s, it, and with the Supreme Court rulings in 62 and 63, we even kicked out the Bible itself from, from public schools. And so the secularization of education uh, is, I believe, the, one of the most, if not the most, uh, fundamental reasons why, which has led to the secularization uh, of the nation. So we must reclaim teaching our children. Now, the good news is we can do something about that. You know, every Christian family can say, okay, I'll assume the responsibility for my children or my grandchildren. I'll train them up in the way they should go and equip them in character and worldview so they can live free. And uh, then I'll help others, and maybe I'll join together, and we can start a, a school, private school, Christian school, where people can can flee the failing government schools, and we can educate them much more efficiently, effectively, and much cheaper. I might add as well. And gradually, if we do that, and, and Christians have been doing that, you know, in the 1970s, 10 or 15 thousand Christians and uh, people in America were homeschooled. Today, that number is, I'd say, two to four million. We don't know exactly. Wow. Uh, we educated all my, my four children at home before, before they went to college. and uh, so, But there are millions that are doing that. Plus, there are tens of thousands of Christian schools that have sprung up. So here's this is good news. There's an alternative. But though that percentage is still very small, 10, 12 percent of the, those educated in America are outside of government schools. But we can do something about restoring America as the land of liberty if we assume that responsibility. And, you know, you mentioned this idea of, of being difficult to live in liberty. You're exactly right. See, liberty is not the default state of sinful man. It's mm. hard to live free. If you leave man to himself, he won't become more and more free. He'll devolve into more and more bondage. So in, in order for a people to live free, they have to be trained, educated. That's what education is. It's not just giving knowledge. It's imparting character. And so and our founders understood that. They understood that we can't be ignorant and free. And so education is to equip citizens to live in liberty. It takes a lot of work, a lot of effort in order for people to live and remain free. And it's not just educating in you know, facts. It's not just teaching someone how to read and write or to get a college degree. It's educating them in the principles of liberty. Like you mentioned the seven principles that we, we uh, have in America's providential history. You know, those are a, a kind of a broad way to state here are principles that the citizens of America must embrace and base their life upon if we're going to live free today and live free in the future. Well, you really dig into this in your newer book, Ruling Over the Earth, and you not only kind of give the inspirational look at it, you need to get involved, you show Christians how specifically to get involved. What are some things believers can do right now, some specific things they can do to get involved in civil issues? Uh, well, one is, I was just talking about, you need to educate yourself and educate others, because yeah. if we don't think right, we will not act right. And so, um, you know, we need to make sure that Christians are reasoning biblically to all of life. So we educate thoroughly so that when they do start to take action, they will act right. So what can we do to 
fulfill our civil duties. Well, certainly one minimal thing everybody ought to do is vote. Hmm. Uh, you know, electing representatives is not an American invention. It's actually a God-given mandate. When God gave birth to a nation, he started a nation, the nation of Israel. He took a bunch of slaves, delivered them out of Egypt supernaturally, and brought them into the promised land to start a new nation. But before he brought them into the promised land, he gave them his law. He gave them his word because he understood if they're going to have any chance of succeeding, they need to understand how life functions. And the law of God is a revelation of the state of reality and summarized in the Ten Commandments. And so uh, so we and and he also gave them a model of government. One component that was part of that their framework of government was election of representatives. Deuteronomy one, Exodus eighteen, uh, talks about that. And many other places as well. But it but uh, uh, Moses was following the godly advice of his father in law Jephro and got the people and said, you know, I want you to go and choose from among yourselves rulers of tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands, and I can set them over you. So they they chose. They elected their representatives who would then govern in their place, in their, their seat on the local or, or, or national level. And so from thousands of years ago, that's the tradition of why today we elect representatives. So people should vote, but they should vote uh, uh, looking at the candidates, evaluating them based upon the biblical qualifications. We can read those in Exodus 18, Deuteronomy 1, basically three qualifications. Leaders should fear God, have Christian character, and have a biblical worldview. And um, ideally, you would have candidates that do all of those. Sometimes we don't have the ideal candidates on the ballots that we vote for. This is uh, as close but, as we can get, right? As close as we yeah, can get. <laughs> exactly. So to me, having a biblical worldview is probably the most important because a man votes based upon how he thinks. And we don't want him to vote and take money out of my pocket and steal my property or my liberty. And he can be a Christian but and sincere but ignorant. So we need knowledgeable people of how to reason from the Bible of all of life. So we vote. But voting is the very least thing that we should do. You know, we, you might some people might say, well, how do the candidates get on the ballot that we vote for in November? Well, that's... You decide that in local party politics, you know, for, 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 that you have to get involved in your, each state is a little different. Some have primaries or precincts, but you can get involved in local party politics and you can be part of the process to select the candidates for a particular party that will then get on the ballot that you vote for. And if all Christians would just get involved in local party politics, we could decide th in most places throughout the U.S., uh, who the candidates are on the ballot would be that we vote for, and we can choose good men, honest men that fear God and think biblically. So we need to educate ourselves, we need to vote, we need to go, get involved in local party uh, politics. Uh, those are you know, a few simple things that we can do to begin to shape public policy. This is really the heart, I believe, of the Providence Foundation, and you're helping Americans, or you're helping Americans get involved. What's some things you're doing there? Well, over the years, we've uh, done all kinds of things. We're uh, kind of our mission is to train leaders to transform their culture for Christ. And so we work with leaders of education, leaders of the church, leaders in business. Uh, we look to anybody who influences others. You know, we want to train so that they can go and train others. That's the model, of course, that that Paul that Jesus did, he got disciples, he trained others. Paul told Timothy, find faithful men to train others. So we've tried to let's find faithful people, equip them, and then send them out. All right, now you go teach others and apply what you've learned. So we've <clears throat> helped get people involved in civil government. A lot of people we've trained in the past are now serving in government. I just, um, years ago, probably 35 years ago, we had a man from Pennsylvania come down to a week-long training seminar and he liked what he learned so he invited us up to Lancaster Pennsylvania we did another week-long training seminar there and and that that 
depth of equipping inspired him to get involved in politics. So he, as a businessman, got involved in local party politics, worked his way up to state party, and now he's a United States congressman, Lloyd Smucker. Uh, so we have, we've trained congressmen, we've trained people involved in school boards and the political process, but we've trained a lots of teachers in Christian schools, teachers in, in government schools. We have specific projects that we do to train pastors to equip them putting out materials and training courses because pastors are vital and a key as we talked about earlier to the equipping of the saints so they can fulfill their mission and the work of service that that they're to do so we've worked with pastors uh, uh, as well we've um, not only in the u.s but many other nations we've have our material translated into 18 different languages We've trained people from over 100 different countries. We've helped establish political parties. Back in the 90s, I helped we traveled to South Africa many times as when apartheid was ending and helped set up a new party that they still have members in the national parliament. In the last number of years, few years, I've been doing a lot of work in Colombia and Brazil, <clears throat> in Chile, but in Colombia, pastors, a lot of pastors, leading pastors in the country, uh, banded together to help support Christians called to the civil arena. They started a new party, ran candidates. They now have three members of the National Senate, congressmen, local mayors, and many others who are serving in government uh, there to try to make a, a, a difference and keep socialism from from uh, taking over uh, Colombia. So we've done a lot of work in other countries as well, helped start up training uh, schools and, and new Christian schools, colleges. Uh, um, so we've worked in many different avenues to plant these seeds, and, and we've been able to see a lot of good fruit come forth from that. Well, this is the kind of work we need, and I want my audience to listen to me. When we think of revival, I know we have a lot of different images in our minds of what that means, but what Mr. McDowell is doing, what his organization is doing, is the heart of the revival that America needs. And here's what I want every single one of you watching to do. I want you to go to EncounterToday.com, and I want you to sow a seed. I want you to give, because we're, we're committing tonight to sowing into your foundation, Mr. McDowell. We want to be a blessing to, do, to you. We want to partner with you. We can't thank you enough for being with us tonight. How can our folks reach out and connect with your ministry? How can they find you? Well, our website is providencefoundation.com, providencefoundation, all run together, dot com. And when you go there, we've got all kinds of articles and classes and videos that are free for you to watch. You can then see the different books and materials that we publish that you can certainly order. As well, we have a Biblical Worldview University courses that you can sign up for. They're very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. You can take them online, uh, go through some of these various teachings that we've done uh, in the past. But we certainly have a, enough material on our website to keep you busy for years and years. We mm -hmm. do have, you know, Facebook page, Providence Foundation, where we post different articles and and current issue, current uh, articles related to events that are going on today and, and other things. You certainly could like ProvidenceFoundation.com on our Facebook page. And we have a regular emailer that goes out just a few times a month. We don't overwhelm you with stuff, but, but it's, uh, we'll send out emailers. You can sign up for that on our website and receive different articles and, that are pertinent for what's going on today. Well, we hope every single person watching will avail themselves to those resources and stay connected with you. Mr. McDowell, thank you so much for your time with us tonight. It's really been a blessing for us. Well, that's my pleasure. I appreciate all that you're doing to educate those in, in your sphere of influence because this is a, a vital for the future of America, and it's encouraging to encounter people and pastors like you who understand the mission and vision and are working and as God awakens more of those we can have hope for our future 
Well, thank you again. And those of you watching, we're going to be having our first Revival Starts Here campaign where we're going to be covering these issues along with some eschatology and end-time events this coming Friday night in Alabama. And you can go to our website for more information. Again, Mr. McDowell, thank you. Those of you watching online, go to EncounterToday.com and connect with us. Let us know you're watching. Comment down there in the bottom and let's, let us know where you're watching from. And be sure to share this video. Until then, we'll see you next time right here on Your Encounter Today. Well, I hope you're enjoying this holiday history special on your encounter today. You know, without your support, we could not bring you videos like this and tremendous interviews like we're showcasing here in this holiday special. Here's what we need you to do right now. Go to EncounterToday.com and give an obedience to the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you give to the Remnants Prayer Arsenal a gift of any size, it doesn't matter the amount, we want to send you as our gift to you absolutely free two of our classes classic series, Teach My Hands to War, and Armed, Powerful Prayers for Perilous Times. These two CD series with more than 10 hours of instruction on the subject of prayer, I believe, can create a massive prayer movement in this nation that can bring tremendous change and a great awakening. Let's all be speaking the same thing. Let's all be praying the same thing by joining together in these series and learning these principles because it's not enough to pray. You have to know how to pray right. So go to Encounter today.com and give under the designation of the remnants prayer arsenal be sure to include your mailing address when you give so that we can mail you these two cd series that i know are going to be blessing to you they make great stocking stuffers too for your loved ones for your family who love the word of god go to encountertoday.com and do it right now and help us continue to preach the gospel around the world all right well grab your bible while you're standing we'll open up with uh, a few verses and then a word of prayer are we streaming? I can't see their team back there, so you can holler at me. Yes, we are streaming. If you see me looking up here, I'm not rebuking the sound people. I'm looking at our online audience. We've got a camera here, and we've got a camera there. So I'm going to be looking at both of them, because how many of you know that our audience is bigger than it used to be? PCC's audience is bigger than it used to be. We're live on YouTube and on Facebook. And those of you that are watching online, write in the comments where you're watching from, whether it's Antarctica or South America or Australia. We've had people tuning in from all over the world. I have a vital message for you today that I believe is going to change your life. So open your Bible to the book of John, chapter number 11. The book of John, Gospel of John, chapter number 11. I'm not in any way feel obligated to entertain you this morning. We have some business we need to take care of as a church. And the body of Christ needs to hear some things that I'm going to be sharing with you this morning, and I pray they stick. John chapter 11 and verse number 46. But when some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done, then gathered the chief priest and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we, for this man doth many miracles? If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. And the Romans will come to take away both our place and our what were they concerned about there? And there? What was it? And? Let's pray. Father, we come before you today, and we pray that you rend the heavens and come down. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your church here and abroad, those that are in this facility and those that are watching online. We don't pray for healing to descend from heaven. We pray for the healer to descend from heaven. We don't pray for blessing to come. We pray for the blesser to come. We pray for a mighty infilling of your spirit within your body that will enable us to be that light, to be that life, to be that strength that our nation so desperately needs right now, God. Awaken us to your truth. Awaken us to your power and fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. You may be seated. If we leave Jesus alone, they said, he will come. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. 
One of the reasons why we resist revival, and if you know anything about our ministry, how many of you have been in a service with us before? Raise your hand if you have been in a service with, with us before. Praise God. Praise God. Then you know that our heart is revival. Our desire is revival. There's a great debate that I didn't even realize existed in the body of Christ as to whether or not in the last days there will be an awakening or an apostasy. Because the Bible predicts a great falling away in the last days that many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. Jesus himself in Matthew 24 warned, warned primarily of deception in the body of Christ. So will there be an awakening or an apostasy? My dear brother and sister, both. For where great where sin doth abound, grace does much more abound. And though there will be a great falling away and much deception and many people that you thought were hardcore believers will fall into obscurity as far as their spiritual lives are concerned, the promise of revival is a promise for every generation, for every people, and for every church. And we can receive that promise by faith and walk in it in the name of Jesus. Everybody say, revival is for me. And say, revival starts here. You're going to learn that if revival starts here, it stays here. I'm going to say that again. If it starts here, it stays here. I'm tired of people wanting to come to a revival service, hoping that will start a revival in their lives. They get hands laid on them. They'll get a few goosebumps and maybe a little bit of a blessing that lasts them for six months, maybe even a year. But it didn't start with them. It started outside of them. And so now they need an outside source to maintain it. Our goal when we come in October for those three days is to start something within you that the devil can't take from you. Yeah, I thought I'd get half an amen on that one. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church today. We resist revival subconsciously. We have an aversion to it because revival demands something of us that we won't, don't want to give up. If you look at what it said here in John chapter 11, you see what they were concerned with. Look at their priorities. If we don't do something, then this is going to affect our place and our nation. And that's where the body of Christ is today. We're more concerned about our place than we are about our nation. We're more concerned about our prominence, our blessing, our position, our promotion, our prosperity than we are about what's happening in our nation. And so we stick our heads in the proverbial sand and we keep focusing on our personal needs. If revival is going to take place, there has to be a shift in priorities from our needs to our nation. There has to be a shift in priorities from prosperity to providence. We have to move in our prayers from self to service. There's got to be a change. And we have right now, if you read our book Encounter, we have what we have now is a children's ministry generation. You know, we were raised now with puppet shows and lights and entertainment. And now you're all grown up and you're here in the church and you want the same pablum being pumped out to you. We gotta have in order to be entertained, we gotta have the puppet show, we gotta have the light show, we gotta have a, what amazing music. I came over to Pastor Trent and said, What an amazing music. And not only the music, the sound people here, great job, everybody. Great job, everybody. That's a science right there. Some of you kind of sit in the audience, you're like, Oh, it's too loud. Like, there's one knob that they just need to turn in order to fix it. That's not how it works. And all the sound people said, Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> A plane flies overhead and can affect it. They've got a, there's a, there's a, there's a science behind it. Man, you've got some amazing people in this ministry who love God and who love this church. And uh, we certainly do as well. I want you to turn to 1 Timothy with me. 1 Timothy. I wasn't sure what order I was going to do this today. But let's go ahead and go to 1 Timothy chapter number 2. Praise God. How much time do I have this morning? You guys are such a blessing. I'm not going to take all I need, but I'll try to take every bit that you need and leave it at that. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Hallelujah. And verse number 1. If you're there, say yes. yes. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, 
intercessions and giving of thanks may be made for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, that we may lead quiet and peaceable, a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What's the first thing that Paul here tells us that we need to pray for when we enter into prayer? All men, but especially those kings who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. You know, we have Fitbits. Anybody have one of those Fitbits? Fitbits tell you where you walk, how far you walk, what you did while you were walking, how fast you walked, so you know whether or not you're keeping a healthy life. You know, you're keeping up with your steps. I wonder what would happen if we had prayer bits that track where we pray, when we pray, how we pray, and what we pray for. And were we tracking your prayer life, dear church, over the last week, would we be able to find any remnants of real impassioned prayer for your nation or for your leaders? Or would it be more about you and yours, your four and no more? I want to talk to you today about a needed revival in the body of Christ. When we think of a revival, we think of, you know, the church being on the fire and the, and the choir is, is kicking and everybody's dancing and jumping and laying hands on people and healing. But a real revival takes place when we begin to put our nation first and we begin to see a resurgence of divine principles that can breathe life into a dead culture. That's when revival begins. There was something called at the founding of this nation, the Black Robed Regiment. The name was given by the British to the fighting clergy of the American Revolution. The British rightly blamed the clergy of America for America's independence, and rightfully so. Here's what was said about Bishop Charles Galloway said this, Mighty men they were of eye and nerve and of strong hand, of unbalanced cheek and heart of flame. God needed not reeds shaken by the wind, but men clothed in or men clothed in soft raiment, but heroes of hardihood, of lofty courage, and such were the sons of the mighty who responded to the divine call. We need a revival of another black robed regiment. Ministers who wore their black ministry robes on the combat field. Reverend Samuel Langdon, he was once the president of Harvard. Reverend, the president of Harvard. You realize Harvard was founded in order to educate missionaries to go preach the gospel. Now it's a moral sewer. Things change very quickly. Reverend Samuel Langdon, after leading men to battle in the Battle of Bunker Hill, Bunker Hill, preached his final sermon as a pastor titled, here's the title of his sermon, Government Corrupted by Vice and Recovered by Righteousness. Not seven ways to have a blessing. This was the title of his message. Government Corrupted by Vice and Recovered by Righteousness. In his journal that day, he said that the congregation was very solemn at the idea that he was about to join the battle. He said, this has been one of the most important and trying days of my life. I have taken leave of my people and shall proceed to the battle. God's servants are needed. This is God's work, he said, and his ministers should set an example that will convince the people to believe it to be such. As he preached to his congregation his final day before he entered into the revolution, he said they were silent as they sat there. He said, then I was astonished when one of my deacons, now imagine this, one of my deacons, now nearly 60 years of age, arose to address the congregation. Brethren, he said, our minister has acted right. This is God's cause. And as in the days of old, the priests bore the ark into the midst of the battle, they must so do it now. We should be unworthy of our fathers and our mothers who landed on Plymouth Rock if we do not cheerfully bear what providence shall put upon us in the great conflict now before us. I had two sons at Bunker Hill, he said, and one of them, you know, was slain. The other did his duty, and for the future, I offer him to liberty. I had thought I would stay here with the church, but my minister is going. 
and so I will shoulder my musket and I will go too. It was preachers like Langdon who rallied the men of their entire church and the fires of the revolution kept burning. It was an impossible task. People today talk about the 4th of July and they say, well, when the 4th of July, when the Declaration of Independence was written, I wasn't free. Well, neither were we. No one was. It was a statement of faith. We were about to face an impossible foe with insurmountable odds for a dream, for an ideal that we knew we would not be able to accomplish in its fullest in our lifetime, but they were looking toward you. They were looking to future generations to establish something that had never been established before. Historian Alice Baldwin said, the Constitutional Convention and the written Constitution were the children of the pulpit. The first great awakening is what gave birth to the American Revolution. The Constitution, she said, is the child of the pulpit. What is the pulpit giving birth to today? Self-help humanism. Selfish. Imposition of our own personal needs when there's a world out that's, that's dying. I know this isn't entertaining, but I think it's what we need today. French political philosopher, say that three times real fast. Alexis de Tocqueville said, I sought for the greatness and the genius of America, and I looked in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, but it was not there. I looked to her fertile fields and her boundless forests, and it was not there, and her rich mines and her vast world commerce, but it was not there. I looked to her democratic congress and her matchless constitution, but it was not there. It was not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame and thunder with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and the source of her power. America, he said, is great because she is good. And if she ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. The original Independence Day, John Adams, you know, they said he didn't really believe in God. You know, separation of church and state, right? Here's what John Adams said. This day, July 4th, ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. I came here today on this 4th of July weekend in order to rouse a sleeping giant. For too long, the silent majority has been silent as we dwell in the devil's demilitarized zone, hoping if we just leave them alone, they'll leave us alone. Those days are over. You are in a war right now. You are in a battle right now. And I'm not talking figuratively. Lives have been lost. Blood has been shed. I'm not calling you to take up physical arms. I'm calling you to take up truth and principle and love and the power of the Holy Spirit to stand against the onslaught that's taking place against the very culture and fabric of this nation that is the only hope for revival in the world. Jesus said they hated me, they're going to hate you. Blessed are you. How many of you want a blessing? Now, come on, how many of you want a blessing? Amen. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely, for so persecuted they the prophets. I don't know if we have a church that really wants to be blessed, but I believe there's a church within the church. I believe there's a remnant, a people within the people who are ready to rise up and speak truth, whether the culture wants to hear it or not. We need another black robe regiment. We need a group of people who say no more. Enough is enough. It's time for that still small voice to become a heralding cry. We can no longer be pacified by a culture and a world that insists we take the back seat on every political, social, cultural, moral issue of our day. We've got to make a decision. You know, every generation has a yoke Every generation has a bondage, but every generation has an anointing to destroy the yoke. 
And we've got to decide whether Christ is superior to secularism. Is God better than government? Is freedom better than totalitarianism? Is creation better than evolution? Are moral absolutes better than relativism? Relativism, adoption, is it better than abortion? We've got to decide if responsibility is better than victimization or patriotism, better than globalism. We've got to decide whether our nation is worth fighting for. You say, well, Pastor, you know, I, 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 really, I really think that, you know, America, you know, under, the gospel is more important. You realize that America is the greatest launching pad that the gospel has ever had. That without this foundation, what we need in America, I was reading some of the Winona Echoes, which are a group of ministers who got together in the 1920s to discuss what was happening around the nation. And they were dealing with many similar issues that we were dealing with. And they say, how can we see a revival in this nation? And they said, there must be a revival of patriotism. There must be a revival of Americanism. Well, pastor, I don't really know about that. Because when you think of America, you think of something secular. We must Christianize the idea of America. We must once again Christianize the idea of America and see a revival in patriotism that births a revival in the church. I was going to say this for the end, but I'm going to go ahead and say it now. It takes great love for a nation in order to intercede for an awakening. Do you realize that? Do you know what love for a nation is called? Patriotism. True intercession for America will only come with a revival of true patriotism. This week we celebrate the 4th of July, 244 years, I believe it's been, of miraculous independence. Do you know what the average constitution in the world, how long the average constitution lasts? Anybody know? 17 years. I've been to Guatemala, you know, the government in Guatemala is constantly in flux. Constitution, even in Europe, the average age of a constitution, can you imagine your rights changing every 17 years on average? Can you imagine being in a revolution every 17 years, and yet here we are 244 years later, standing as a sign, as a beacon of light, as a miracle before the nations? And how have we been able to stand? Because we had God at our center. And now we have drift, drifted away from that anchor. We have drift, drifted away from our moorings. We're at a war in our society. Some are calling it a cultural war. But it is a war for the future of America. 244 years ago, 56 men gathered in Pennsylvania to draw up the Declaration of Independence. It was a fortunate hour in America when we had greatness to spare. King George III denounced all Americans as traitors, and the punishment was that they would be hanged by the neck until dead. In response to that threat, John Hancock signed his name so big and so bold on the Declaration of Independence so that the king could read it without his glasses. They signed with ink and they paid with their blood. I'm not suggesting that all of our founding fathers were Bible-believing Christians, but of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 52 of them were. And all of them believed that the Christian ideal was the right ideal. All of them believed that we should found this nation on Christian principles. Now you know believers, you know, I've talked to pastors this week. Well, you know, everybody, everybody should have the same level playing field as far as in our government in America. Everybody should kind of, if, if, if Christian's going to pray, then, you know, you got to have, you got to let the Muslim pray. No, you don't. They should have liberty to do whatever they want to do, to pray however they want to pray in their homes, on their private property, in their churches. But Islam didn't found America. Christianity founded America and should hold a special place. In our meetings, the founders thought it was so important to have Christianity as a central part of government that they established prayer in the name of Jesus before every national government meeting. Even the secret service, before they begin their detail, have to begin with prayer. Thomas Jefferson, he is considered by many faux historians to be anti-Christian. He was not. He took tax dollars to fund missionaries. Imagine a politician suggesting that today. 
not missionaries for a, you know, a neutral faith that would just the God, whoever that may be. No, no, no. To advance. Here, well, here's what, here, let me tell you what uh, George Washington said. He said, Christianity, religion, and morality are essential pillars of society. John Adams said in 1798 that our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people and is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. Thomas Jefferson said that the Bible is the cornerstone. The Bible is the cornerstone of all liberty. This idea of the separation of church and state is nowhere in our founding documents, is it? Nowhere in our founding documents. There's actually only one constitution in recent history that mentions separation of church and state. That is the constitution of the former Soviet Union. Which is not something I believe we want to pattern ourselves after. They want us to believe that they wanted separation of church and state. And after signing that document every Sunday morning, they would go into the state house to the largest church service in the nation. And worship every Sunday morning together in the name of Jesus. We're not buying it anymore. We're not buying your version of history anymore. We're going to believe what the Bible says. And we're going to believe what our founders have said. Anybody with me so far? It's time we take our country back. Our country's been hijacked by a secular humanist worldview, which is trying to rewrite history in an effort to add validity to their argument of separation of church and state. But the Bible says, if the foundations be removed, what shall the righteous do? Edward Gibbons, interestingly enough, an historian, wrote on the rise and decline of the Roman Empire. It's held as academias one of their greatest works of history. He gave six reasons for the fall of the Roman Empire. I'm going to give them to you now. Number one, a rapid increase of divorce. Number two, the validity, the belittling of the sanctity of the home. Number three, higher and higher taxes with public money being wasted. Number four, a mad craze for pleasure that became more and more sensual and brutal. Number five, gigantic armaments of war while the nation declined eterna internally. And number six, a decline in faith in God that became nothing but a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. The greatest need in America today is the preaching of the gospel in power to the nation, directed right at our leaders, directed right at citizens as voters. It may seem like an impossibility, something you may never even considered, but we can preach the gospel without being partisan. I don't have to take sides politically in order to preach the gospel because I got news for you. When you do, both sides are going to have to hear it. Both sides need to be rebuked. You need to be like Samuel who stands in the middle and says to the right and to the left, you're both wrong. It's time we got involved. Paul said, first, pray for your nation. Well, I voted for them because they said I'd get something free from the government. Somebody said, getting something free from the government is like getting a blood transfusion from one arm to the other and spilling 90% of it on the floor as you go. The government doesn't, well, the government will pay for it. The government doesn't have any money. The government has zero money. You know who pays for it? Working people pay for it. My son had to pay taxes this year. He's 16 years old. And 50% of the United States is not paying taxes. But my 16-year-old had to pay taxes. Something's happening in America. We need to change it quick. The good news is that the powers are ordained of God. Daniel says that he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings. And he sets up kings. We need to pray for our nation. How many of you have a need, an urgent need in your life that you need prayer for? Healing in your body, finances, family salvation. Anybody? Raise your hand. Let me see. Let me see. This is important. Because I teach a lot on the subject of prayer. Prayer cannot begin with a selfish motive. If your prayer life begins and ends with you, how can we expect God to hear us? How can God hear our prayers if they are rooted in selfishness? Me, 
mine, ours. Our prayers must return to what they're meant for, not for you. The Bible says, pray you one for another that you may be healed. So, and if I want to be healed, I need to pray for you. I need salvation in my family, Pastor Allen. How much time have you spent praying for your nation to have salvation? I need healing in my body. How much time have you spent praying for healing for your nation? I don't have to ask you. I don't have to do a survey. I don't have to put a prayer bit on your wrist to find it out. I can just look at what's happening out there. Prayer works. Amen. And the fact that there's nothing working out there tells me we're not working in prayer. The first meeting, and I want you to turn very quickly to the book of Psalms 35, and I won't be much longer. Psalm 35. Pastor Allen, this, this is not like you. Normally you walk around the stage like a caged lion. I've been concerned. I've been concerned that we've trained the body of Christ to listen to the way something is said rather than what is said. I'm concerned that we have the style of ministry and I, the way I preach is the way I am. That that raucous, loud, the way I walk across the stage and how loud I get and how, how I shout, that's how I pray. That's how I am in private. This is very difficult for me. In fact, there is a restraint right here that I'm attached to to my belt to keep me right here. It's very difficult for me. But I, I thank God that through this whole quarantine, He has taught me something that the Word has power to move when I can't move. The Word has power to touch you when I can't reach out and touch you. And I've began to learn that what's needed is we need to teach the body of Christ once again. You know, I, I listen to Les, Dr. Lester Summerall. I listen to folks like Derek Prince. And I, I read people. There's, that you can't listen to them. You have to, you have to read their stuff. And I'm concerned that what I'm seeing from the pulpits of America today are teaching Americans in, in some way, shape, or form not to be able to handle that kind of meat. We're not able to handle it. If somebody's going to stand up here, you know, it used to be Jonathan Edwards read sinners in the hands of an angry God. It said he read it so close to his face you couldn't even see his face because he needed to see the words. And he read it monotoned. No inflection. And yet people fell prostrate in the altar, grasped the pillars, feeling as though the ground was opening up underneath them and at any moment they could slip into hell and they were crying out for mercy and for grace. And he just stood there and read it because the anointing did the work for him. Sometimes our preaching, you know, it's become so stylized and flashy. You, you've seen it. You see Christian television. But where's the substance? Where's the doctrine? The church has become so easily deceived so long as it sounds good. I think we're ready to move beyond it. The first meeting of the Continental Congress in 1774 in Philadelphia, 13 colonies came together. They didn't know each other, and those that did, they didn't like each other. Most people don't realize that at this time, your state was your nation. And so, even after the birth of America, for a long time, you had dual citizenship, essentially. So you had your state, which was your first priority, and your nation, which was your second priority. And so they came together, and they could not come to an agreement. And so the first thing they decided to do was pray. We're going to pray. And I don't mean the kind of prayers that you see, congressional prayers today. I'm not talking about that kind of praying. I'm not talking about even the kind of prayers, I don't know how many of you ever go to the National Day of Prayer. <sighs> no, they prayed for two hours. Some of them were prostrate on the floor. Others were knelt at their chairs, weeping uncontrollably. Others had their hands lifted for two hours as they prayed. 
And John Adams wrote home to his wife. And he said, Abigail, during our time in prayer, God spoke to us. He spoke to us from the 35th Psalm, and we now think for the first time we can actually beat the British and we can win. He said, I beg you, Abigail, I beg you, read that psalm. Read the 35th Psalm to your friends. Read it to your father. Have the minister read it to the congregation as well. For the first time, we believe we can win. In addition, he said, we've been, fa we've been fasting, and we're going to call the people. This was his letter to his wife. We're going to call the people to a time of prayer and fasting. Can you imagine, Abigail, millions upon their knees at once before the great creator imploring his forgiveness and blessing. He smiles on America and he will release his power upon us. Here's a political leader aligning his politics with providence. And he said, read the 35th Psalm. Read it. I want to read just two verses, maybe three, from it for you here this morning. Psalm 35, and I want us to look at verse 26. This is David praying. It is David as a political leader. He's praying. He says, let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. But let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. Here's a political leader praying for others to pray for him. Here's how you pray for your nation. He says, let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. You understand David was not always righteous, but his cause was righteous. We don't need a Sunday school teacher as our leader in Congress or in the Senate or in the presidency. We just need somebody who will do that which is right in the eyes of God. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. David says, raise up people who will pray for my prosperity, that whatever I put my hand to, it will prosper as I pursue your righteous cause. Now, America has not always been perfect. Evil has arisen and taken hold of this nation more than one occasion, but that's not how it was founded. It was not built on tyranny. It was not built on slavery. That's what we backslid into. It was built on liberty for all. In fact, the first constitution that was drafted by Thomas Jefferson said more about abolishing slavery than it did taxation without representation. Oh, the liberal news media didn't tell you that, did they? The strongest language in our founding documents and in the first draft of the constitution was about abolishing slavery. Of the signers of the Declaration of Independence and of the Constitution, three out of four of them wanted slavery totally done away with right then and there. Before any other nation was talking about it, they were reaching for it. North Carolina, Georgia said we can't go that far yet, though they wanted to see it abandoned eventually. And they had to rest on something that was unanimous among all the states because we're all going to die if we can't come together. And so they put language in the Declaration of Independence intentionally so that although they couldn't abolish it now, it could be abolished later. Hmm. Frederick Douglass understood that. It's amazing what we're not being taught today. Thomas Jefferson was the greatest voice of abolition probably in American history. But he owned slaves, Pastor Allen. Yeah, and Dr. Martin Luther King was an adulterer. Life's complicated. Grow up. It was illegal for Thomas Jefferson to free his slaves. Illegal. And so he spent his life trying to change the law. George Washington, illegal for him to free his slaves. The only caveat at his death was that you could free them at your death. That was the only way you could do it. And so that's what he did. They closed that loophole quickly before Thomas Jefferson died. So he fought his entire life to try to abolish it. America was not founded on slavery. It was founded on liberty. 
July the 4th is a day of liberty for all people because without it, where would, where would America be? Where would the world be? There'd be no Juneteenth without July 4th. And thank God for Juneteenth. But we wouldn't have it without July 4th. And so we must allow, please, ladies and gentlemen, for nuance. We cannot abandon our history because it offends us. You can go today to Germany. You can go today to Poland. And there are concentration camps standing to this day. You can tour them. I was just speaking with a precious woman from Poland and Jews in that nation. They don't walk by there and say, this reminds us of a horrible time of slavery. We need this torn down. They say, no, don't you dare tear it down. You better leave it up because if we don't leave it up, we'll forget quickly. And if we forget, we'll repeat it. Go to Israel today and you'll see monuments to David over here. And then right across the valley, you see a monument to Absalom. Streets named after King Ahab, one of the worst leaders ever to walk the face of the planet. Why? Because we must remember our history. You know, the Bible it doesn't just tell you about David's victories. It tells you about his defeats too, doesn't it? Why? So we can learn from the good, the bad, and the ugly. He was a great king. And then it tells you he was a murderer, an adulterer. Why? so we can learn, so we can grow, so we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And if there's one thing we've learned from history, it's that we don't learn from history unless we keep it in front of our face, night and day. That was free. <laughs> Hallelujah. Prior to 1815, the government called the people to pray and fast 1,400 times. That's a little bit, isn't it? I was praying around October last year, and God gave me one word concerning the latter end of this year and the next four years. That word is terminal. That's the word God gave me. Concerning America, concerning this nation, he gave me one word, terminal. Unless we do something, we could lose everything. We have to reestablish Christian education. We have to invest in it, have to be a part of it. I brought here with us, and we have a stack of them there at our ministry resource center there on the lobby. This is the New England Primer. This is what the founders wanted our children to learn in school. This is how they learned to read. This is how they learned to write. And this is how school children were taught in public schools for 150 years in America. When you're learning the alphabet, you see these little images. We have them on the table there. I think they're $5 on the table. Get one. Get one for your friends and your family. And when people wonder about separation of church and state, just show them what the founders wanted taught in our public schools. It says, in Adam's fall, we send all. That's how you learn the letter A. Heaven defined, the Bible mind. B, C, Christ crucified for sinners died. D, the deluge drowned the earth around. E, Elijah hid by ravens fed. This is how we learned our alphabet. Oh, they wanted separation of church and state, you know. B, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Let's see. C, come unto Christ, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and he will give you rest. D, do not the abominable thing which I hate, saith the Lord. E, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I think this will be a treasure in your library. Yeah, come on. Come on. Revival doesn't start at the White House. It starts at your house. Well, I just want to focus on winning souls, you know. So you're just going to win souls and lose a generation? Well, we're concerned about just, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. That's all I'm going to focus on, you know, just one-on-one. -on -one. And you ought to focus on that. We're going to lose a nation. 
I believe the church is ready for this responsibility. I believe that we've been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. I believe that prayer works. I believe Jeremiah 33, 3, when he said, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible says, What things soever you desire, when you pray, if you believe you receive them, you shall have them. And that your heavenly Father knows what you have need of even before you pray. I want to challenge you today, dear believer, when you stand and pray, the first thing you need to do when you pray over your food, when you pray at night before you go to bed, and when you wake up in the morning, say, God, in the name of your son Jesus Christ let revival come to America again father I believe I receive an awakening among our national leaders in the name of Jesus I pray that whatever they put their hand to in accordance with your righteous cause will prosper in Jesus name it's time to get back to it we've had enough ministers mildly coddling the masses we need to get back to real gospel preaching Everyone stand on your feet with me. I was going to call you down here, but I don't feel led to do that because I think too many of you would come. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you, do you have a need? Are you hurting? Are you struggling? God has the answer. Do you know him? Are you prepared to meet him? If you were to die today, or should he split the eastern sky and come to take his church away, would you be ready? I want to pray with you today. But here's what I want to suggest. I believe healing is available. We may see it take place right now in your body as you're standing right there. In fact, if you would begin to pray with me, believers, just begin to pray with me with your spirit and with your understanding. Those of you watching online, I don't know what your needs may be. We're about to pray. Is it healing in your body? Is it restoration in your marriage or in some relationship? Is it salvation in your family? Are you struggling with turmoil, anxiety in your mind? Here's what I believe. When we begin to pray right now, those things are going to be taken care of. But we're not going to pray for those things. We're going to pray for our nation. And as you, right there, you, pray for your nation. I believe healing is going to come to your body. As you, right there where you are, pray for your nation and for your leaders, whether it be the school board, the city council, or the Congress, I believe something's going to happen in your finances. As you, as you shift your focus off of yourself, I believe you're going to get the attention of heaven. If you'll agree with me right now, I want you to lift your hands. Lift your hands. Hallelujah. I feel the Spirit of God already moving. Now begin to pray for your nation. Come on, don't be ashamed. I can tell you this, those people that are out on the streets aren't ashamed of whatever they're advocating for. Let's not be ashamed of what we're praying for, what we're believing for. God bless America. Come on. God restore America. God heal this nation. God end all schism, racism, division, politicism. God end it all in the name of Jesus through the power of the God. Come on, begin to pray that way. I'm just your tour guide through this now. I want you to pray. Well, how would you pray for your need? Pray for your political leaders just like you would for your, because they've got the same needs. They're struggling in their families too, and it's distracting them from doing their job. Pray that their needs be met in the name of Jesus so they can focus on the task at hand. Come on, come on. I just want to see what you've got to pray. Father, we come before you today corporately. Your word says one can chase a thousand, but two can put 10,000 to flight. You said what things soever we desire when we pray, if we believe we receive them, we shall have them. We're about to pray some things that we believe and we're ready to receive. We know that you're listening from heaven and so we pray for our leaders now 
They're struggling. They're battling against forces beyond their comprehension. And now we bind every distracting, every retaliatory, every tormenting spirit, every spirit of politicism, every antichrist spirit, every spirit of division. We bind it now in the name of Jesus. We cast it down. We release the power of the Holy Spirit in every sphere of government, whether local or national, to bring clarity, to bring an understanding of truth and a conviction of that truth. Oh God, let boldness arise in every political leader that they will not be moved by the mob, but they will be moved by the power of your spirit and the truth of your word. Oh God, within our institutions, in our educational system, let there be in a revival of the awareness of your presence. Let the fear of God grip the hearts of every individual that holds on office and let them have judgment day honesty. And I believe that as we're praying this now and as we commit to continue to pray for our nation, you are releasing healing into your people, deliverance into their minds, peace into their homes. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be free from the chains that have bound you and receive the glory of God in your life and in your body. I'm telling you right now, go ahead and lay hands on your body, lay hands on your head, lay hands on your belly, where, whatever you may be struggling with, and receive the glory of God. For you have made His priority your priority. You have made His passion yours, and now there is nothing He will withhold from you. Receive it by faith right now in the name of Jesus. Receive it by faith. I see peace coming now. I see billows and billows of peace rising right now in your heart. Those of you watching online, I thank you. I thank you for joining with us. I believe you're receiving the peace of God now in your home. The strength of God in your home. Our focus is beginning to shift now. Say this with me. In Jesus' name, my focus is moving from my needs to my nation. From prosperity to providence, from self to service, I receive a burden for my nation. I receive a passion for revival. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, bless him. You can do better than that. Come on, put your hands together and bless him. You may be seated. I feel the power of the Holy Spirit here. Yeah. I feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that He can move beyond our ability. I feel so, I can be real honest with you, I struggle as I minister this for a variety of reasons. I feel like, oh, they're turning me off. This is, this is boring them. They're not interested in this. They're never going to invite me back again. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I have to do what he tells me to do. I have to say what he tells me to say. And it's time for revival in America. How are we going to accomplish that? Well, through the Revival Starts Here campaign, and here's what I wrote down. I need to get my, I had about, I don't know, 15 pages of notes for you, it feels like today. Here's the things the Lord has put on my heart on how we can bring restoration to our nation. Number one, we take personal responsibility. Revival starts here. If it starts here, it stays here. We begin to look inward. Greater is he that is in us. Not selfward, but inward. Number two, we support the nation of Israel and do what we can to bless that nation. That does, that's more than just financial donations. That's going there. Do what you can to, to support the nation of Israel. Number two, or whatever number I'm on, <laughs> preach the gospel to every creature. We must become missions-minded to reach the whole wide world. If, if America loses its mission, it loses its power, its anointing. That's the reason why we're here, ladies and gentlemen. We, we, we somehow went from being the missionary, the world's missionary, to the fourth largest mission field in the world. We've got to turn that back around. We've got to get our focus back 
outside our borders. Equip believers. Provide a place for them to come, to gather, to coalesce, to be trained in the things of God, to demand holiness, to preach it, and to hold each other accountable. There's a few other things, but I want to focus on to equip believers. You are in a place right now that is really unparalleled when I compare it to many other ministries whose heart and whose focus is souls, 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 souls. Palmetto Community Church is not just a church who's here, you know, to make sure that they have a good number of people sitting in the seats. Your leadership really cares about you, about your family, and about those outside the four walls of this ministry. You have a mandate now more than ever. And those of you that are watching online, you listen to me. If you're not a part of Palmetto Community Church, whatever church you're a part of, you have a mandate to make sure you're supporting them now more than ever. Your tithes and your offerings are going farther than you can imagine. You're reaching the world through this ministry. And I, Pastor Trent asked me today if I could receive the tithes and offerings. This is not an offering for myself. This is an offering for this ministry. Because Palmetto Community Church, now those of you at ECC, those of you who are watching online, let me give you this edification right now. Your tithe does not go, if you're not a part of ECC, your tithe does not go to ECC. You won't hear preachers say that. But that's what the Bible says. Your tithe goes where you're fed. The house where you're fed. As we prepare for our tithes and offerings, now if you're at ECC, you go to EncounterToday.com and you get your tithes and offerings. <laughs> But whatever church you're a part of, Palmetto Community Church, listen to me today. I want us to do something together corporately to let the leadership here know we're behind you. You have people here from Guatemala who are ministering the gospel. While you're asleep, they're ministering. We here represent ministry that takes place in Pakistan as well as in Israel and in other parts of the world. And you don't know what's going on, but your leadership makes sure they stay in touch with us. They've got, you know, as when you're pastoring your church, there's a lot of things to focus on. You don't really have time to focus on other things. But the leadership here, make sure they make time. How are you doing? How are things going over there? Is there anything we can do to make sure the gospel is being preached? In the middle of all this, the nation of Israel has shut down. They are a tourist nation. And so a lot of the way their economy, a lot of the way people make a living has been shut down in the nation of Israel. You know, your ministry has not in any way stopped in their support of what we do in the nation of Israel, they just keep moving forward in the middle of this quarantine and in the middle of this pandemic. And I believe they deserve a great big hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do. Thank you. When we, when we go to Israel, we don't, you know, we don't have this big, this big, large Israel ministry with a lot of overhead and some of your funds go to paying salaries. No, we're able to just put it in the hands of people doing the work that are ministering to people. And the tears that they have when we're to go to them and say, the other ministries support us as well, but we can say, you know, PCC, they've helped make this possible. And they don't know what to do but just to give God thanks. And that's what we want them to do, to give God the thanks because he's making it possible. Today, let's prepare our tithes and offerings. You know the tithe is 10% of the sanctified gross income, and the offering is anything above the tithe on obedience to the Holy Spirit. But let's prepare it as holy today. Do they have offering envelopes that they have available for them? Are they in their seats or are they passed out by the ushers? Grab an offering envelope. Everybody get your tithe and offering in your hand. We're going to pray together with our online audience. And if you're making checks, you make them pay payable to PCC, Palmetto Community Church. And if you're, I don't know if your cards make it available for, um, your envelopes make it available for online giving, for card giving. You all know how to do all that stuff. Let's do it together. Once you have your gift ready, stand up on your feet. If you're able to, if you have a baby and you're not able to, or you can't, out of the way, stand up on your feet. Praise the Lord. Those of you watching online, we want to pray over your offering as well. We thank God for you. If you're part of PCC and you're not able to be here today, be sure to go to the website and give that way. We're going to stand in faith with you right now. Let's today focus our faith on reviving this nation as we give today. Let's pray that God use the ministry we're sowing into as a lever as leverage to push this nation in the right direction. Somebody say amen. amen. Father, we come before you today in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for everything you've given us. 
Everything we have is because of your grace and your mercy. And as we stand here today, we bring this offering as an offering of thanksgiving and of praise and obedience to your word and an obedience to your spirit. And we pray that as we sow it, you multiply its effectiveness in this ministry and that we would receive a hundredfold, not only in return to bless us, but in its effectiveness to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you that as we release this today, we receive revival for our nation. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen. They are asking that you come and lay your offering, I believe, on the altar. As you come, why don't you just lay it on the altar and say, God bless America. Come on, bring your offering. Those of you that are watching online, thank you again for joining us. We can't wait to see you next time. Don't forget to go to EncounterToday.com for all the news and information about where we're going to be next and what God's doing in our life. We'll see you next time. God bless. Come on, bring your offering down and give God some praise. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this holiday special concerning America's history. Be sure to like this video. Make sure you share it and let all your friends and family see it because it's vitally important that we understand America's history. And we want you to go to EncounterToday.com and give in obedience to the Holy Spirit to help us to continue to bring more content just like this to you and your family. We love every single one of you. We thank you for partnering with us, for standing in faith with us, and we'll see you next time right here on your encounter today.